Okay, it appears that we're live. Welcome back to the um, public hearings of the Environment and Transportation Committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Kumar Barve, the chair, and the chair, Dana Stein, is with us as well, as, as are most of the members of the committee. The bills are gonna be in the following order. 160, Delegate Bagnall, 214, Delegate Malone, 264, Delegate Charcutian, 267, Delegate Grammer, 204, Delegate Learman, 295, Delegates Love and Henson, and last bill of the day is going to be 407. And with that, um, let's begin with House Bill 160. Delegate Bagnall is here. You get four minutes, and it appears nobody's signed up in opposition to the bill. So that's a good thing. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Delegate Heather Bagnall, District 33, Anne Arundel County, and I am here testifying on behalf of HB 160, Environment, Wetlands, and Waterways, Riparian Rights. You have my written testimony, as well as news articles regarding the events which transpired, which were the impetus for this bill, so I will try to summarize. For the last seven years, the Cape St. Clair Improvement Association has been in the permitting, planning, and funding process of an extensive shoreline restoration and resiliency project. I grew up in Cape St. Clair, so when they reached out for support, I was well acquainted with uh, not only the shoreline and the project, but with the impact that restoring the shoreline would have for the 8,000 plus residents, nonprofits, and greater Broadneck community who access the beachfront. I was also well acquainted with the longstanding covenants which protected the shared land and water access held by an incredibly active community association. However, as they were finalizing the project and the funding after multiple public comment periods and good faith efforts to address concerns of property owners within the shared space, they were shocked to learn the county had granted permits for based solely on a checked box asserting riparian rights. The only notice the community received was when the barge pulled up to install the pilings. Part of the issue is the permitting process. When it is a big resiliency project, such as the community was undertaking, the county follows the state, and MDE had not yet issued the permit as the community continued to address concerns raised in the public comment period. The private property permitting process, however, is county followed by state. So in issuing the permits based on the application and a checked box asserting the rights, the county essentially assigned those rights without regard to notice, uh, without regard to or notice to the holder of the covenant. Now you'll see in the information from MDE that technically permits cannot reassign riparian rights, but the outcome is essentially the same. In the end, the courts found that the rights still belong to the community association, but not before they spent $40,000 in legal fees. The next community association may not have the same resources and it simply shouldn't be that an abuse of the permitting process and the honor system sets the precedent he with the most money wins. That brings us to the bill today. My intention with HB 160 is threefold. Establish a repository of existing covenants and agreements maintained by MDE that will become part of the public record and easily accessible throughout the permitting process and regardless of which agency is the primary authority. Create a visual map of existing covenants which can be accessed by the county and the state and ensure the holder and or the enforcer of the covenant receive notice of the permit application before issuance so that in future, if the riparian rights are called into question, there will be a mechanism for all impacted parties to respond before it goes to the court. Now, the language of the bill as drafted is too broad. And as you will see from the letters of information from MDE and DNR, I am actively working to refine the bill and more narrowly limit the scope so that we don't essentially freeze time and hold riparian rights in perpetuity, which could inadvertently prevent resiliency efforts. We are also amending the bill to clarify that the holder of the covenant should be active in making a good faith effort for resiliency and that they will be self-identifying, which should significantly reduce the fiscal note, as it was never my intention that MDE be responsible for a hundred year reach back of all existing covenants. As this loophole in the permitting process has been clearly laid bare, and as we are dealing with the impact of sea level rise and climate change, I believe strongly that the clock is ticking on closing this loophole to protect our communities, our resiliency efforts, and our shared access to the 7,719 miles of shoreline. And I ask this committee for a favorable report. Uh, thank you. Any questions for the sponsor, uh, Delegate Ruth? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I, I see that there was written testimony from the Cape St. Clair Association. Um, I, I gather you've been working with the association and are on board with the work that you're doing. 
Yes, and in fact, um, the the uh, holder of the covenants, the notification for the holder of the covenants came directly from the the uh, community association after we had the initial drafting of the bill. They asked that, that we really uh, clarify that, and we we are amending that onto the bill. We're just trying to determine where in the bill it's the best fit. Thank you. Um, any other questions for the sponsor of the bill? Seeing none, we uh, have somebody signed up with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Eric Fisher, and he is uh, signed up as favorable with amendments. Uh, so, uh, Eric. Thank you, Chairman Barve, members of the committee. Good afternoon, Eric Fisher with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, here in support with amendments, um, our interest in amending the bill is, sounds very consistent with what the delegate just outlined. Uh, there were certain sections of the proposed legislation, A and B, that could have conflicted with um, riparian rights or reassigned them um, in ways that could have made things rather complicated. But we are um, fully supportive of additional information helping make better decisions about shoreline management. These shorelines are extremely important for our environment. Uh, they are some of the most ecologically valuable and productive portions of our state. Um, and being clear about who has the right to access what and when um, will help keep those in, in good shape. So um, we appreciate the delegate reaching out to us um, and um, look forward to continuing to work to refine part C of the bill. Um, we would prefer that parts A and B, um, at least as currently drafted, be held by this committee. Thank you. So you don't like two thirds of the bill, huh? <laughs> I think the uh, part part C of the bill really is is the meat of, of where um, folks were interested in heading and we're very happy to work on language to that effect. All right, we'll work with you. For some reason, every year I have to re-educate myself about riparian rights. For some reason, it just doesn't stick in my mind. I don't know why that is. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions and it appears just for the record that um, uh, DNR is not, you know, uh, you know the, the administration isn't opposed and uh, the Anne Arundel County government appears to be in favor. So, okay, thank you very much. That ends the public hearing on House Bill 160. Let's go to House Bill 214. Delegate Malone is Delegate Malone in the House. Oh, there he is. Welcome back. Th thank you, Chairman. How are you? You know, so far, nothing horrible has happened, so that's good. Um, and if I assume I'm on the, for some reason, I'm seeing the clock very prominently, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you. Well, thank but, you. But wait a minute, before you start, I oh. just want you to know that you, there are two parallel lines just to the uh, right of that gigantic blue clock, and you can click on that and slide it over to the left and make it smaller, so, um, uh, or not, whatever, whatever is your pleasure. I'm fine with just rolling up. Um, one thing I try to do is I try to be brief, so I will try okay. to present, present this bill briefly and go for enable it. you all to move on with your day and I'll go join judiciary. So uh, thank you, Chairman and, and, and other members of, of the committee. Um, this bill, and I don't know how much background Delegate Bagnell gave, because I think she went just pr prior to me. I, I was juggling between Zooms. And this bill came, so I'll bring, hopefully I'm not boring you with a restatement of the problem that arose within our district. The problem that arose within our district is we have a community beach and a community association that in addition to having a large playground area, beach area, when the community was developed in the 1920s and 1930s, the, the community had riparian rights and had you know, the right to walk along a beach to the property owners to the left and to the right of the park. Then within the, the past few years, some of the property owners to the right, um, or in particular one property owner uh, felt that due to erosion of the land of where the beach had been back in the 1920s and 1930s, that the their property now went from basically they could walk out of their you know, back door walk across their backyard and then put their feet in the water, that the land was now gone. And so now there was no longer, you know, land, water, 
uh, you know, land, land, community association um, area, then water. It was just their backyard and land. So the private property owners began to build, uh, build began to build a pier, and lots of litigation then ensued. And the goal of this legislation is so that in the future, both sides know what's going on and that things don't happen before everybody's apprised of things. And then the only way things stop is for there to be lawsuits filed, temporary restraining orders issued, and everybody is able to be properly informed. Um, ask for a favorable report and we'll be accepting amendments. Yeah, before I recognize Delegate uh, Ruth, let me just ask a question here. Have you worked with Delegate Bagnall on your legislation? Have the two of you talked to one another? We have we have not not talk, talked a great deal on this. Um, Senator, this is cross-filed from Senator Riley. I'm certainly willing to talk to Del Delegate Bagnall to make sure we're on the same page. Um, this is a bit of a tricky wicket type legislation. And one of the things I'm concerned with is to make sure we don't pass something that has unintended consequences. Um, I think everybody's shooting for the same goal, but we wanna be sure that um, we don't create more problems than currently exist. Um, okay, I noticed that um, unlike her bill, the county government hasn't weighed in, um, uh, hasn't weighed in. Uh, so are they neutral on the bill, your bill, or uh, is that- uh, At this point, I assume that they are, they are neutral on the bill. Okay, right. uh, Delegate Ruth has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Delegate Malone, for being here and participating in this conversation. Can you um, briefly explain the differences between your bill and um, Delegate Bagnell's bill? Are you familiar with her bill at all? I'm or? somewhat familiar with her bill. I think her bill, um, I think, is looking to provide a creating, potentially creating a list of, and I'm, I'm a, somewhat concerned her bill may put an onus on the state that if the state trips and fails, um, that it might be problematic for all concerned. Um, so I think that needs to be looked at and potentially addressed. I can say this, I believe uh, Mr. Hyatt is signed up to testify in my bill and he is familiar with those concerns. Um, I think he had hoped to possibly testify in Delegate Bagnell's bill, but um, with many being new, um, I'm not sure he was able to be signed up for that bill. Yeah, so I understand that the Delegate Bagnall is working with MDE, and I, I guess that would address the, the concerns that you have. Um, I, I, I yeah, yes, and, and I'm, I've just began reaching out to MDE to also to make sure we cover those bases. Like I said, we need to be careful with this and make sure we don't have some unintended consequences. Um, thank you. Now, I notice um, I'm actually very familiar with Cape St. Clair. Um, I uh, am a member of a um, Catholic community meets in the clubhouse there and has met mm -hmm. in the there for, for many, many years. So I've been down there many times. Um, I, I noticed that the, um, the community association did submit testimony in support of Dele ba Delegate Bagnall's bill, but they did not um, submit testimony in support of yours. Are you working with the community association? I am. I spoke with their council just yesterday um, and we are discussing possible amendments um, and had a nice discussion with their council just yesterday regarding ways to make sure this is done properly. So, so at this time they're, they're not supporting, but you're working with them to try to get support. Correct. All right, thank you. Delegate Healy. Thank you very much. Um, Delegate Malone, is the uh, Anne Arundel County delegation planning to take a position on either one or both of these bills? I'm not aware of that at this time for either one. Okay, thank you. This bill is not looking to be just for Anne Arundel County. Um, the issue that um, that's looked to be addressed with this bill is areas in Anne Arundel County, but there's other areas in the state by way of an example is um, Ocean City, um, in particular on the Bayside the Inlet, there's community associations where that could come into play. There's some areas up in Baltimore County um, with some of their waterways where there could be um, associations in it um, where it could come into a play. Um, unfortunately, with the ongoing eroding of shorelines um, through whatever cause, whether it be climate change, more more boats on the more boats on the waterways. Um, it, 
it's one of these things. This is not a one one community association issue. It's going to affect all many of the waterways and the communities that abut them and the private owners that abut them throughout the state. Thank you. That helps. Okay. Any, anyway. <laughs> any further questions for the sponsor? I, I understand that um, Stephen Hyatt, uh, who is an attorney, it looks like, has signed up favorable with amendments. So why don't we take Mr. Hyatt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members, for the record, Stephen Hyatt. I am an attorney in Annapolis, and I, uh, I've handled many uh, riparian rights issues in my uh, extremely long four-year legal career and uh, was involved in the Cape St. Clair issue. Uh, to be clear, for the record, the courts didn't conclude anything in that issue. Um, it was, uh, there was a settlement reach, so the legal issues were not resolved. Um, and I did reach out to Delegate Bagnell, but I haven't heard back yet. Uh, but for this bill, the real question is, the community association uh, at issue, they reserved in their original declarations um, riparian rights to land that has since eroded away. And so the, the question is, did their reservation include the riparian rights that were future acquired. So the folks that have land that was in between or that was separated um, from mean high water, which gives you riparian rights, those folks now have the mean high water line on their property. So they have acquired riparian rights and they built out a pier. What's being proposed doesn't really resolve that. Um, I think it's a, a good start, but there needs to be additional uh, notice requirements. Um, I think that, you know, riparian rights, as, as you said earlier, come up quite often and they're relatively complex and relatively uncodified. Um, and I'm going to continue working with Delegate Malone and I'm also working with Senator Riley on the, the crossfire version, Senate Bill 21. Uh, but this is a pretty complex issue dating back to, I'd say, 1745 in this state and really needs to be looked at farther, further into uh, the, the unintended consequences um, of just you know, these kind of snapshot one issue uh, problems that I think there would be unintended consequences from. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I know my time's up. Yeah, uh, we've got a question from uh, Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Mr. Hyatt, uh, you represent you represent one of the. Uh, I apologize for that. You represent one of the um, property owners or the developer. Is that correct? Yeah, formerly represented, no longer representing them. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear you disclose that in your testimony. Um, so, would your would your proposed amendment? Um, I, I was reading it last night and you know trying to understand it, um, and where it says. Uh, Provable such rights have been, uh, it, unless to the extent provable such rights have been expressly reserved or otherwise severed from the land, would that ha would that language have um, allowed? I mean, would that language have prevented the community association's shore restoration project from continu continuing? I don't think it would have prevented it. It, it. The point of that language is to put folks on notice that there is a chance that they don't have uh, the riparian rights that are typically presumed to exist with uh, waterfront property. I think in this instance, um, again, the question is unresolved if, if the reservation in the original declarations by the Cape Sinclair Community Association, if that language, which reserved all riparian rights on Cape St. Clair owned waterfront property included uh, waterfront rights that come with time due to erosion. Um, I don't think that this would resolve it. I don't think as proposed it would resolve it. And I don't think Delegate Bagnall's uh, uh, legislation would resolve it either. Well, thank you so much. Sure. Any other questions for uh, this witness? Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the public hearing on House Bill 214.
uh, I understand that Delegate Charcutian isn't with us. So we're going to thank you, Chairman. Go to uh, the next bill, House Bill 267, which looks like it's going to be a relatively short one. So is Delegate uh, Grammer. Mr. Chair, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Go ahead. With your permission, I'll start. Uh, for the record, Delegate Robin Grammer here to present House Bill 267. House Bill 267 uh, puts in place uh, reporting by the Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, the reporting would report back to the General Assembly on the affluent discharges at the sewage treatment plants and the impacts on midge populations uh, on the surrounding communities. Uh, let me make sure, is my camera okay? Can you see me? We can see most of you. Yeah, we can see. You. Okay, great. So this bill passed last year, uh, passed the full house, went on to the Senate, and we ran out of time. This is a really important issue for uh, really any community that lives adjacent to a sewage treatment plant, but especially the waterfront uh, and water adjacent communities in Legislative District 6 in southeastern Baltimore County. Uh, the, what happens is uh, these effluents, they, uh, they, they feed algae and the algae uh, really cause a massive spread of midge populations. Midges are small flies uh, and, and they, they only live for two or three days, but their prime job is to basically reproduce and you, ends up with, you end up with giant clouds of these little flies. Uh, if you live on the water or you, you own a property on the water or have a business there, you won't even be able to walk outside. They'll be in your, in your ears, in your face, in your mouth. Uh, but even, even off the water, you'll have these giant clouds of midges on your property and it's nearly impossible to go outside. So what we're asking the committee to revisit this bill. Uh, this is really important. I, I, I'm hearing people who live in these communities who are saying, if, this, if we can't fix this, if we can't do anything about this, I'm just, we're just gonna move. Uh, so with that, I'll close. I'd be happy to take any questions and I'd ask for a favorable on House Bill 267. Okay, well, um... Are you saying that this bill is exactly in the same state it was in when it left? Uh, the only thing that's different is we put my two, last year? two reports per year instead of one. That's the only difference. Okay, so it's almost the same. It's Other than that, it's identical. Okay. Um, okay, we do have some questions, and I think the first one goes to Delegate Weivel. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you, Delegate Grammer. I just want to know, can you provide last year's bill number? Um, if you pause very briefly, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but I can, I can get it to you. Yeah. A lot of times it'll be referenced in the floor laptop, but it's not referenced here. So if you get it to us, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Oh, will do. Thank you. Delegate Ruth. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Delegate Grammer, can you just clarify, I understand the, uh, the Baltimore County Executive supports this bill, is that correct? So he did send in a letter of support last year. Um, now, I, I, I don't have access to a lot of the bill files this year, so I'm not sure if that you might have a letter. Yeah, actually, we, we have a letter from Charles Connor with the Office of the County Executive, and it's favorable. Fantastic. And the bill from last year is 836. Thank you. Okay, House Bill 836 from last year. Okay, uh, Delegate Ruth, do you have anything else? No, okay. No, I'm uh, sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, Delegate Parrott. I knew you were gonna ask a question. <laughs> Mute. You, you're muted, uh, Neil, you need to unmute yourself. Got it. Am I on? There you go. All right. Good. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for committing. Uh, Delegate Grammer, thanks for bringing this back. When I hear about midges, I think about black flies, which is a similar type of problem here in Washington County and actually along the whole Potomac River. And I'm going to read your bill more specifically. Um, but would there be any way for us to work together on the midges and the black flies as a part of this bill? Sure, absolutely. You know, I actually had plans to travel to um, one of these plants in Delaware. Someone who lives in the, an impacted community, um, he works at in Delaware, and he, he talked to people out there, and he said, like, look, they, they have one in Delaware. They don't have these issues. They know how to remediate it. I was planning on actually just going out there to, like, visit and talk to people, but with COVID, uh, it, it put the kibosh on that. Um, but, yeah, I'd be really happy to work on you with this issue. 
I, I didn't want to go too crazy with the first bill. I thought that putting some reporting in place and just seeing what data we get back uh, was a good start. But uh, call me anytime. I'd be happy to talk with you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any, any more questions? Uh, if not, thank you very much. That ends the public hearing on House Bill 267. And I see so much. Charcut. Yeah, no, no problem. I see Delegate Charcutian is with us. So why don't we go to House Bill 264? And you have four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chair Barve and uh, Vice Chair Stein it's, uh, and colleagues, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, I have in front of you House Bill 264, Organics Recycling and Waste Diversion Program. And um, I am thrilled to have this bill here again. As you know, the clock is ticking on climate change. And one of the really important pieces of the puzzle that we need to address is waste and waste management. And I know you all know that. And I think that you all also know the importance of getting organic waste out of incinerators and out of landfill, both for the carbon dioxide methane emissions that contribute towards climate change. And I think you also are also all aware of when we take that organic waste and we turn it into healthy soils, the potential as a carbon sequestration um, and to prevent erosion and all the other good stuff that comes from putting the, car uh, the, the compost back into soil. So I think that this committee has a really good understanding of those basics. And so what I wanna focus on is the power of this particular piece of legislation to grow the compost infrastructure in the state. What this bill does and what uh, is a model off of many other states legislation, um, is that it says that if a large waste generator, so this is large grocery stores, um, food distribution sites like, um, like the one in Jessup, um, it's uh, massive uh, hotels potentially. Um, and when, when these large food waste generators produce more than two tons of waste beginning January 1 and more than one ton beginning January, uh, sorry, January 1, 2023 and more than one ton in 2024, if there is an organics recycling facility within 30 miles, then they cannot send that waste to landfill or an incinerator. So what that means is if there is nothing, if there's no place for them to send it to compost, then they just keep doing whatever it is they're doing. But if there is some place for them to send it to compost, then they either need to compost anaerobic digest, send it to anaerobic digestion, or they can donate um, donate for food recovery. And you'll be hearing more about food recovery in a moment. So what this does is it says right now, one of the problems we have in the state is that we don't have enough compost infrastructure. And when you look at this from the perspective of someone who's potentially building that compost infrastructure, they, when they build that infrastructure, have no way to be sure that they are going to have enough feedstock that people are going to divert from their current sending it to landfill to divert it to the compost. And so by putting this law into place, what we're saying to the compost industry, to the anaerobic digestion industry is if you build it, they will come. If you build it with a cost competitive model, then they will come. And so in addition to uh, requiring this diversion, giving some flexibility for the waste generators in, um, in how they engage with this, the other thing I do want to highlight that this offers is that it offers a waiver option for the waste generator. So let's say you are a grocery store and you weren't sending it to landfill, uh, you were sending it to landfill, and then a compost company comes and sets up and within 30 miles, that compost company does not, cannot have the market power. They can't gouge, um, they can't set up uh, price gouging structures because you as the waste generator would have the ability to go to MDE and say, here's the price in our current situation, here's the price in the new situation, so we're requesting a waiver. So really it's a very elegant way to ensure business for compost, to build out the compost infrastructure, but do it in a way that makes sure we're also protecting the businesses who would potentially have to use those systems. Um, I have several witnesses who are gonna talk about the importance of this and that when they finish, I'm happy to take additional questions. Thank you. Okay, well, before we get to them, any uh, questions for the sponsor? Uh, um, let me just see who was first, hold on. Uh, looks like, um, oh, hold on. Looks like- uh, oh, Delegate Healy. Healy, Healy was- I, Well, hold on. Um, yep, Delegate Healy, you're first. Oh. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted, uh, the last thing you said about the waste generator being able to negotiate, would they negotiate or would they just demonstrate that it would not be cost effective? My concern, as you may know, is that um, in Prince George's County, we have quite a few food mm. deserts and we would not want to discourage large grocery stores from locating by putting an additional burden on them. Um, but if it's the same cost, maybe it's not so much of a burden. Yeah, well, so thank you. And there's actually two pieces to how this relates to food desert. So one piece of it is that it would be the same cost because there is a waiver it's on the, um, that says basically they can outline that it's gonna cost more to use the compost as opposed to the landfill. And then they can get a waiver from having to follow this from MDE. But I think the more important thing as it relates to food deserts is for example, in Vermont, when they implemented this policy a number of years ago, what they found was food donations increased by 30%. So what that means is the grocery stores or whoever it was, restaurants or, or, or hotels, were throwing away food that could have been rescued by these food rescue organizations. And when this requirement that they essentially not throw it away, but they could either compost or they could donate, all of a sudden it was possible for much more of this food to be rescued and donated. And so especially right now, as we're looking at, and in a few moments, you're gonna hear from someone who does food rescue in, in uh, my community, um, this ability to uh, limit the food going into landfill also supports food security efforts. Thank you. Okay, uh, Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Delegate, uh, you you uh, talked about how this is a um, you know motivation for uh, building the market by I mean making the market available and encouraging growth of um, the the infrastructure. But we're also hearing from opponents that um, you know the infrastructure is not there yet and, and that that's a burden. Uh, can you address that, please? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, in some ways, actually, the opponents have made my case for me. The infrastructure is not there, or we don't have sufficient infrastructure. So every place in their comments that they say the infrastructure is not there, I think the answer is that's why we need this bill. Because if the infrastructure is not there, then there is no requirement on any business, on any food generator to do anything different. But what this does, because the infrastructure is not there, is it says to people who might build that infrastructure, if you build this, the market will be there. And so really it's a very elegant way of kind of balancing this place that we're in where we need that infrastructure, but we can't get that investment um, because there isn't a surety that it's gonna be used. Um, at the same time, we can't put a burden on businesses to use an infrastructure that's not there. And so what this bill does is it balances, in fact, the infrastructure is not there, so you don't have to do anything different, but when the infrastructure is there, we'll be asking you, the businesses, to engage with that infrastructure. So the, the, the 30 mile limit is what helps the businesses to not have too, too much of a burden. <coughs> Well, correct. So if there is no compost infrastructure within 30 miles of the grocery store, then that grocery store doesn't have to do anything different than what they're doing. If compost infrastructure gets built within that 30 miles, now they have to use it unless it's more expensive, unless they can demonstrate a significantly greater expense to using that compost infrastructure than whatever system they're currently using. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I recognize the next uh, question, does the bill say uh, greater cost or significantly greater cost? What it says is um, it is a, it's written as a waiver. Uh -huh. So the waiver can be uh, undue hardship because one, the cost of diverting food residuals from a refuse disposal system is not reasonably competitive with disposing the food residuals <laughs> at a refuse disposal system or to any other reasonable circumstances. So it does, it puts the, I mean, it, MDE would have to establish the specific regulations of how it is that they are gonna, um, they are gonna engage with, uh, with that waiver. I will say if folks have some specific suggestions, I'm always open to amendments. Okay, uh, next uh, Delegate Boyce. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Delegate um, Charcutian. Um, Delegate uh, Ruth somewhat asked my question about infrastructure, but I wanted to go a little further and ask about the infrastructure of the 
um, of the business. And so, you know, we had the, the waste um, reduction and recycling um, throughout this summer, um, a lot of work groups. And, you know, what we learned, of course, um, is we, we do have a, a, a broken system and a system that works in pl some places and doesn't work in other places, um, in some places where they compost and some places they don't. So I'm, what, I'm, I guess, asking questions about not so much as the infrastructure and in that, you know, if you build it, they will come, but the infrastructure for the actual business and that this is not something that they're actually even, some people aren't doing now at all, especially these bigger folks and, and how this bill um, uh, either helps them or hurts them in, in that regard of infrastructure. And so say, for instance, there is something in a 30 mile uh, radius, but I haven't been quote unquote, diverting my own um, uh, systems, right? So everything kind of goes in the trash together. So what are, um, can you speak about that infrastructure and how potential uh, commercial businesses um, would get some assistance in kind of beginning that process? Sure. Um, thank you for that. So I think there's interesting uh, conversation by email with the Retailers Association. They may be uh, joining, um, pretend, I'm not sure exactly what position they're taking. They, they, what they said is they believe that most of their grocers are already in compliance with this, but they're still checking that out to see if that's the case. But let's just go with uh, Delegate uh, Charcuti and oh, they're sorry. signed up in opposition. Sorry? They're signed up opposed. Yeah. So, well, you can follow up with them because the email to me says that most of their grocers are already, um, do they believe they're already doing this? But like, uh, obviously you can ask them additional questions about that. Um, but let's say you're a grocery store and right now you're not doing this. Then the compost facility gets built 25 miles away. You produce, again, keep in mind more than two tons of organic waste. That's a lot of waste. Even when it goes down to one ton, that's a lot of waste. And I'm happy to share with you, Massachusetts has had this for a while. And so they have a uh, waste generate, they have sort of this cheat sheet where you can look and see, um, you know, what that means. Um, and so just to give you a sense of it, if you were talking about a high school, um, about how much this is, if you were talking about a high school cafeteria, um, the high school would have to feed uh, 5,000 students a day in order for it to meet that threshold of, um, of one ton of, weight, of waste. And so we're talking about quite, quite a large facility, quite a large institution before this becomes, we're not talking about your small mom and pop restaurants, for example. A restaurant that does full meals with 70 employees is the Massachusetts estimate. 70 full-time employees is the Massachusetts estimate of what produces one ton of waste. So it really is these, these larger um, institutions that we're talking about. So that's a really important piece. And then the second piece of it though, to your question is, yes, we are asking them to do something different. We are asking them then to internally build the structures in place, separate the waste at the site, donate it if that's the best thing for them to do, or send it to the compost if that's the best thing for them to do. But we are asking them to make a change. And I just wanna say that I think we're trying to really do this balancing act and do it in a way that has the least burden on everybody possible. But the bottom line is we have to make a change. We need to make a change. We need to make major changes if we are gonna address the crisis of climate change. So I don't want to pretend I, I've really built this in a way that I think it is as non-disruptive as possible. Um, and I think we've seen from other states how positive it's been. We've seen from other states that businesses have very seamlessly engaged with it. We've seen from other states that food rescue goes up. There's all of these other positive things. But the bottom line is we do need to make change. And it is on us as legislators to force that change in our communities if we're gonna effectively respond to the crisis of climate change. Um, thank you, Can I, just one quick follow-up questions. And um, you mentioned sure. um, other states. Um, can I ask, did they build this out all at the same time or did they create the infrastructure first and then create somewhat of the mandate or um, just wanna get a better idea about how they constructed this? Yeah. So they use the mandate to force the infrastructure, right? They use this same approach. I mean, obviously there's states that have done different things, but the ones that I'm talking about, so the Massachusetts, Vermont, New Jersey, used this approach 
to then phase in and build out the infrastructure. Now, several of them, Massachusetts, for example, doesn't have a waiver at all. Um, and they have been successful in, in making this work. I chose to put the waiver in, uh, New Jersey has the waiver. I chose to put the waiver in after having a lot of conversations with businesses in the state who had concerns about the cost. So I, I still think that it can work. I've also spoken to compost and anaerobic digestion facilities who say they believe they can be competitive. And so they believe they can still be effective even with a waiver. Um, so I've talked to all the folks involved that believe that this, this approach can work, but this is the approach that built out the infrastructure in those other states. Thank you. Thank you. Next question goes to Delegate Otto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I think I unmuted myself this time. I thank yes, the, you managed uh, to do sir, that. For, I thank the sponsor for bringing this forth. But uh, my concern is, uh, do you have a property uh, near your house that uh, uh, you'll let me get a permit to build this facility that's going to compost all this uh, material? Well, let me say this. I do have compost in my backyard. Um, but your broader question- I do too. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can share compost tips at some yeah. point. Um, but the broader question I think that you're asking is that there are, in addition to the need to build out this, this sort of approach from the business side, there is the need to make sure we're permitting compost facilities. Um, and I, I think like with any bill, you know, we come and we address a major piece of the issue. That doesn't mean it addresses everything about the issue. Um, but to your question, one of the things um, that MDE recommended when they studied this issue, including the permitting question in 2017, they made a series of recommendations. And one of the recommendations was that DNR do an analysis of where on state properties um, and other public properties, where would be good spots for compost, just to sort of then have that map in place. Um, and since 2017, when MDE recommended that out of this work group, they haven't, no one's moved forward with that. So one of the things my bill adds in the uncodified language is to move forward with that. And the hope is that recognizing that there's still issues of permitting and so on that need to be addressed, that that may help create a map that supports then businesses that are looking to get uh, the compost built um, that, that that analysis would support that and to some extent help with finding the places that would be more easily permitted. So we're creating another state uh, agency or something like MES or something to uh, uh, do to composting? Well, no, actually MES does run compost facilities. They, for example, they run the compost, they built and run the compost facility in Prince George's County. And I think we have uh, someone who was part of that, who's going to testify in a moment, and he can say more about that, that effort. Um, so this doesn't create a new agency. MES could be part of, of these efforts if, if that was right for the area, but a lot of it would be private business, I would expect, would be building this out. Um, what this just does is it, it, it takes MDE's recommendation from 2017 that DNR do an analysis, just so that we have that analysis done, and it may help MES or local government or private businesses look at where there could be compost facilities um, and streamline that, that process. Well, I uh, thank you. And uh, we believe in composting and have done for years. Uh, I think this committee uh, t uh, has gone to a couple of different dairy farms uh, over the years who, uh, that are, are uh, recapturing methane and I know one in uh, Cecil County was getting uh, uh, food waste from Philadelphia, was being hauled in there to help uh, generate the uh, process. And uh, it, it's been a good thing. And also we went to uh, outside of Seaford, Delaware that Purdue has made a tremendous investment in uh, composting of uh, chicken litter and, uh, and things. So, uh, um, We'll move from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your patience. Okay, uh, Delegate Frazier Hidalgo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Delegate, this, this bill is in the same or similar posture as the one you had last year? It is very similar. I will tell you there's two changes, uh, well, there's three changes to it. Uh, well, let me, let me ask you a question. Um, mm -hmm. 
because let me ask you the let me ask you a specific question and then sure. because it, it sounds like it sounds pretty similar um bills can get off the rails for any number of reasons um some of them are legitimate reasons some of them aren't very legitimate reasons and some of them are scare tactics and i remember last year in subcommittee when debating this bill for some reason people got in their heads i don't know why delegate charcutian everybody got this in their heads um, and I'm really, it's really a disgusting topic to bring up, but I want you to give you the opportunity to address it now because it was unaddressed last year. And it has to do with um, rats. So so last year, for, for whatever reason, some people got it in their head that this was going to lead to uh, this massive infestation. Rats were gonna come from all over the country uh, to Maryland specifically for this. So I wanted to give you an opportunity because I just had a really hard time wrapping my head around that concept. It, it seemed to me like it's gonna be the same no matter whether you separate the material or not. So um, if you wanna address, I guess how the bill might be different and or address the, I don't know if lunacy is the right word, but um, if you want to address, God, rats. Um, thank you. I would love to <laughs> rats. Um, so I, I think that uh, I agree with what you're saying, which is that opponents who may be concerned about a bill will often throw out a bunch of different ideas to capture our imagination and, and potentially distract us from the ability to talk about the actual policy in front of us. And so um, but when the issue came up last year, I think um, the suggestion was that the rats are all waiting until we separate the organics out from the cardboard and out from the plastic in order to come and eat it. Um, and that once we separate it out, that's when they're gonna come and attack our dumpsters. So um, um, a couple credits short of my animal biology and behavior PhD, but it's my understanding that rats come and eat um, trash if it's not put out right and that they don't come and eat your trash if it is put out right. And there's no reason to believe that separating the organics is what they're waiting on to come and eat your trash. Um, so that's just kind of a basic fundamental rat behavior thing that I think is fair to say. Um, having said that, we did last year, and I'm happy to share it again, um, take a number of photos so people could imagine. I think part of it was people trying to figure like, I know what a dumpster out behind a restaurant looks like, but what does it look like when you source separate it? And what does it look like when you take that to um, an actual compost facility? And what does it look like when you, you know, like, what does it look like in practice? What does it look like in the cafeteria? And I think what you want to imagine is in the same way that you know, probably 20 years ago, this committee was debating whether we should ask people to pull the cardboard out and recycle it. Um, and that seemed like, uh, you know, an outrageous inconvenience to ask restaurants and, and, uh, and grocery stores to do that. And now it seems like the obvious thing to do. I think it's similar. So you, now you, instead of having two bins, you have three bins. Um, and I'm happy to share with the committee, I will follow up with the, the, both the photos as well as the descriptions of how that's done so that folks can have a picture of the nice clean way that that looks. And if you're managing your waste well now, there's nothing that would be different about once you start source separating it. Okay. So to the best of your knowledge, there's no like advanced um, like rat team that go out first to gather intel and then go back and tell all their friends that none of that exists, right? You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go on to the next question, which I think goes to the vice chair of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Delegate, I have a question about the mechanics of the bill. Um, I understand that a um, source of organic residuals wouldn't have to take it to a compost facility if there isn't one within 30 miles uh, of their location. But the bill also talks about um, other items or other activities that the facility would need to engage in. Looks like managing the food residuals in an on-site composting facility, providing for the collection and transportation of the residuals for agriculture use. Um, so I guess my question is, are those voluntary activities if, if the items can't be taken to, if the material can't be taken to a compost facility or would they be mandatory sort of second tier activities for, um, for, for the producer of the residuals? Yeah, thank you. So here's the way that here, here's the way I see it it working. So in and I'll I'll send folks the link from Massachusetts where you can click and say, okay, so for a grocery store, 
grocery store with 35 employees is estimated, unless they prove otherwise, that they're producing one ton or more per week. So starting in 2024, a grocery store producing one ton or more a week with a compost facility 25 miles away, this now applies to them. So that's the first thing. So first the question is, does it apply to them? So first we figure out, okay, yes, this applies to them. At that point, they can decide what they're gonna do with that waste. So now that this applies to them, this one thing they can do is send it to the compost facility. Another thing they can do is compost it on site. Another thing they can do is increase their food donations. Another thing they can do is work with, you know, to get it to a farm for animal feed. So all of these are their choices so that, and, and they would then demonstrate to MDE that they are not sending more than one ton in 2024, two tons in 2023 to the landfill. And so they can use any mix of these strategies that are on here. The assumption is most of them will use that compost facility. Um, but the finding from Vermont is a lot of them actually end up shifting to increasing their food donation. So any mix of that, but the point is that it's the 30 mile radius that triggers them now having to do something different with their organic waste. Okay, so just to clarify, if there's no composting facility within 30 miles, they're not required and under your bill to do any of those other things. Correct. Okay, great. Mr. Vice Chair, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, uh, next question will go to Delegate Learman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Delegate Charcuti, and thanks for bringing this bill, and thank you, Delegate Boyce, for your comments about the work group. One of the things that's come up a few times is restaurants, um, and I know the Restaurant Association has in the past been concerned, and I was just wondering if you could clarify how this affects restaurants at this time. Um, yeah. Sure. There's a couple things, and I've spoken with the Restaurant Association a number of times. So um, I think the first thing that I would highlight is that the vast majority of the smaller restaurants that many of us are concerned about, and in fact, I have, you know, worked very closely with my local restaurants to help them make it through this very, very difficult time. The vast majority of those restaurants will not be affected ever by the bill as it's currently written, and certainly not in the next four years. So that's a really important piece because I recognize that all of us are struggling to figure out how to help these small restaurants survive the next few years, survive now in the next few years. Um, and this bill, even though I don't think that it would hurt them if it was in place for them, it doesn't affect them at all. So it's kind of a, a moot point. In 2024, when the one ton requirement phases in, then a restaurant that, according to the Massachusetts website, is um, has 70 full-time employees serving uh, 2,000 meals per week. That is likely to be the type of restaurant that once we hit the one ton would become, uh, would fall under the requirements of this bill. And that would be in 2024. So hopefully for lots of reasons, um, you know, even those restaurants, everyone is sort of out of this, this difficult time. But if in 2024, that 2,000 full scale, full meals, per week, full, uh, full service restaurant, full meals per week, um, we're still struggling as a result of the pandemic. I would say that would be the kind of thing that the waiver is designed to help, you know, when it says other legitimate circumstances, you know, one could say, we just came out of this pandemic a few years ago, we're still suffering, here's why, and here's why making this change in, um, in our waste management plans um, would be problematic. Oh, well, you're on mute, I think, are you talking? Sorry, I was just saying thank you. That's helpful. Okay, uh, next question goes to Delegate Clark. Jerry? Yeah, I'm, there I am. You got me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Delegate, for uh, this bill. Just a couple questions. Um, so if... if um, if I own a McDonald's restaurant that's of average size or bigger, and I'm 20 miles away from um, a composting station, and you know some of these stores can have easy 60, 70, 80 employees, uh, would I be, have to adhere to this uh, to this ordinance? Um, I am looking. Uh, sorry, I'm, I I don't know all of the metrics off the top of my head. So I'm trying to look at this, the Massachusetts estimates. 
limited service restaurant, full service restaurant. I'm trying to see what a, I, I'm, I can, I can get back to you with the answer. Right. If you're a full service restaurant with 35 employees, three, sorry, I, um, I'm not, I, it's not, it's, um, I think that, so if you're, if you're a, a fast food restaurant, um, presumably you have less organic waste because you're not doing as much uh, full scale prep where you're, you know, chopping the kale and throwing the kale, you know, uh, stems into, into the, the trash or the compost. So, so this, the fast food restaurants um, would have to be even larger to meet the standard. It would take me a minute to, to go through this website and figure out what that standard is for them. Um, but so potentially, but I don't think so. Yeah, uh, and second question real quick. Um, uh, you made a statement earlier, if you build it, they will come. Well, one thing that I've learned in my, my years in business is it's a lot easier to come if you got an incentive to do it. So as as places are built that to accept this uh, uh, this material and things like that, basically people that meet the criteria are uh, they're not coming on their own. They're coming because the ordinance makes them come. So have you ever thought about maybe there ought to be some type of incentive to the uh, to the end user establishment? be say a tax credit of some type that would, the money could be used to help to subsidize the, uh, the company that would build the compost facility. Uh, they would get some type of crack credit for doing that too. Uh, because no matter how you figure it, there's gonna be some more cost of the business uh, having to separate the food and, and keep it separate in some way, shape, or form, they're going to have to change their operational procedures and maybe do some different things uh, with the way they store uh, their waste and stuff like that. So uh, if there was an in, more of an incentive for them to do that, uh, they would come along a lot lot easier than, um, than your mindset is if you build it, they'll come. What would you think of that? Yeah, I would um, absolutely support um, uh, other policies that would move us in the direction. And as I said earlier, I think the climate crisis looming means we have to change what we're doing and we have to change it as quickly as possible. So the balancing act of trying to do it with all of the restrictions we have of businesses and the path that they're on. Um, so, so sure, yeah, I think there's lots of stuff that we need to do to grow recycling, to grow organics recycling, all of those things uh, to, to reduce waste to begin with, all of that, absolutely. This particular legislation, as I've looked at models across the country, that if you build it, they will come and saying to the compost facilities, uh, organics recycling facilities, if you build it, we're guaranteeing if you can make it cost competitive, we're gonna ask these businesses to use your system. That's the, if you build it, they will come. We are asking folks to do things differently. We are asking the businesses to do things differently. We're requiring them to do things differently if it can be done in a way that doesn't cost more. Um, and I think we need to put, you know, it, you know, it's, it's time to leave it all in the field to, to get this, save this planet. So yes to tax credits and other policies and yes to this policy that, that I'm offering today. So okay. would you be, would you be amenable to an amendment to your bill for to include a tax credit of some type into it? Well, let me just say that that would require the bill would have to be uh, referred also to the Ways and Means Committee. I, I do want to mention that my bill does have another thing that MDE recommended back in 2017 that never happened is that the Commerce Committee um, look at exactly what you're saying, Delegate, um, look at um, what kinds of financial or other incentives would encourage food waste reduction and composting. And so my bill does require that commerce follow through on that suggestion that the administration had made a number of years ago. So that's kind of consistent with the direction that you're headed, even though it's not an explicit tax credit. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question goes to Delegate Harrison. Thank you. Um, just real, real quick, um, how did you come up with the 30 mile um, determination? Um, that's a good question. I, I think that we came up with it, and I say we because I consulted with a lot of different compost experts and I looked at other states and what they had done. Um, and it seemed like a, a reasonable, um, looking at where sort of businesses are in the state, it seemed like a reasonable 
um, figure. And it also, you know, we want to set this up so you're not incentivizing driving. Um, uh, I mean, you don't want to add the emissions from driving, um, driving the waste, you know, 60 miles, 100 miles, 200 miles to get to the compost. And so it's, it's sort of a balancing act. I, I don't think there's one perfect number, but it seemed when we looked at all of the different ways that we could, we could do it and what the map looked like for the state and so on. Um, it seems like a good number. If, if there's another number that someone wanted to make the case for, I would certainly look at it. Okay, uh, next question goes to Delegate Amprey. Thank you very much. Um, just wanna go back to the uh, restaurant question. Um, I know that many of the restaurants in my district and the surrounding areas wouldn't necessarily be affected by your bill, but I'm uh, thinking about uh, the expansion of food halls. We see a lot of food halls here in the city and I'm, I'm trying to understand how would food halls be impacted by this bill? Would there be a responsibility, I guess, the building owner or whatever compact they currently have mm -hmm. in order to uh, get rid of their waste? Just wanted to get your thoughts on that because it is a growing industry here. Yeah, yeah, I think they would. So, so I would expect that, I mean, I don't have an exact number in front of me, but I would expect there would be food halls. So the idea behind the way the bill is written and then the way it's been interpreted in other states, um, of course, MDE would have to write the regs for here, but is that wherever the, unit is that has the waste hauling contract. So if the food hauler or the mall's food court or the whatever it is has one waste hauling contract as opposed to each individual stall having a waste hauling contract, then that whoever has that contract would be the one who would be responsible for complying um, with this bill. And so in the same way that they would, a food hall would have right now, what you see is trash next to maybe aluminum recycling or next to paper recycling or next to commingled recycling. You see that you just, you, now you'd see a third bin there and you would see a third bin outside. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It appears that there are no further questions. So first signed up in favor, Aaron Greenfield. Aaron, you out there? I am Mr. Chairman. Mem okay thank you yeah. for the opportunity um, i'm here on behalf of bioenergy devco and we're here favorable on house bill 264 peter ettinger has signed up uh and here's uh you'll hear from him later he's here at my request and he'll speak uh, more specifically about the maryland food center authority uh in jessup and the actual infrastructure that does exist bioenergy devco has a u.s headquarters here in maryland has over 20 years as an industry leader in developing, constructing, and operating anaerobic digesters. And we are, in fact, again, the infrastructure, uh, and we're growing here in the state. Uh, MDE estimates that Maryland food generators produce up to 998,000 tons of excess food waste per year. And reports suggest between 30 to 40% of that food is just wasted. And it's typically the first or second largest component of a municipal solid waste stream. This excess organic waste is typically disposed of through unsustainable means such as incineration and crowded landfills. Uh, food waste, as we've discussed, can have significant impact on the environment, economy, and certainly food security. And other states, as Delegate Charcutian mentioned, has looked at waste diversion as a solution you know, promoting this organic recycling infrastructure as this bill does allows waste to be repurposed and in our case into truly renewable natural gas as well as an organic soil amendment. And for those reasons, we respectfully request a favorable report. Okay, thank you very much. Let's next go to Dan Israel. Uh, Mr. Israel. Is Dan Israel out there? Yes. Mr. Chairman, oh, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of the bill. I'm here on behalf of the employees of Compost Crew and our CEO, Ben Perry, who sends his apologies. He could not join you today. Compost Crew has almost 10 years of experience collecting and composting food scraps. We currently serve thousands of households in the state of Maryland, and a growing number of businesses use our services, including apartment buildings, restaurants, grocery stores, and senior living communities. These businesses have signed up for our service to help reduce their trash bills and because they recognize the importance of diverting their food waste from landfills. We've been serving some of these businesses for many years now, and we've learned a lot about best practices for implementing organics recycling successfully. 
And so too have a number of other organics recycling companies in the state. We are proud to have built a healthy and growing business. Last year, we diverted 5 million pounds of food and organic waste to area compost facilities. However, food waste still represents more than 20% of the waste that we throw out. And voluntary participation in organics recycling programs won't move the needle fast enough to address the challenge that we face as a state. <clears throat> in order to grow organics recycling quickly in Maryland, a mandate for large scale food waste producers is one part of a recipe for success. The bill also tasks the Department of Commerce to explore financial incentives for composting and the Department of Environment to identify locations for additional facilities those sections of the bill are essential ingredients. The timeline proposed gives businesses sufficient lead time to take steps to reduce their food waste and plan for the necessary changes to source separate their food residuals. So we urge the delegates to support this bill. It's a balanced approach that will incent more participation in organics recycling, which will in turn extend the life of our landfills, boost the health of our local soils, and help the state do our part to combat climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Peter Rettinger. Uh, Peter, are you out there? Hi, I am. Thank you, Chairman Barve. Thank you, Vice Chair Stein. A pleasure to be back in front of the committee. I'm sure it won't be the first, it's not the first nor the last time. And as Aaron Greenfield has mentioned, we're here in favor of House Bill 264. Uh, for those of you who don't know what we do, we build anaerobic digesters. The anaerobic digester is part, is really known as an organic recycling. Uh, facility. We work closely with composting uh, organizations. In fact, uh, Delegate Otto, you mentioned the Seaford facility, uh, formerly run by Purdue. In fact, we operate that facility now because we believe in composting and we believe in organic recycling and we believe in the merger of those two, two items uh, is a way to solve the issue of uh, waste, uh, or at least what others consider waste that typically uh, now goes to landfill, incineration, and land application, while at the same, while at the same time being able to create a clean, green, uh, renewable energy product from whether it be electricity, whether it be uh, renewable natural gas, or even hydrogen. We're very pleased to be part of the Maryland uh, Maryland's infrastructure. In fact, I would invite everyone in the committee to come to the Maryland Food Center Authority, where we are constructing in the middle of construction of a five-acre. Uh, anaerobic digester that will take in over 110,000 tons of food waste. I would point to though the importance, uh, we were very fortunate uh, to be able to go and, and make calculated decisions based on funding and based on our analysis of an area which is predominantly driven by feedstock. If, for those of you who don't understand MFCA, there's over 106 uh, different facilities from Domonte to Pappas from large to small who produce great, great amount of waste that traditionally now has to travel either two to three hours to a farm, uh, looks for a compost op opportunity, uh, or is now going to landfill or land application. This type of a law, this type of an opportunity uh, provides these kinds of companies, anaerobic digestion companies to grow, to establish themselves here in the state of Maryland, to be able to integrate uh, with our friends in the compost industry. In fact, what we do is we also create a digestate that's equal to, or in, uh, in fact, in front of your committee, Chairman Barbie, two years ago with Andrew Cassidy, we talked about uh, digestate being the same or similar to uh, compost use. So we go the full circle. We really are looking at the, the entirety of the problem and we are pleased to support this bill we believe it's not an, only an economic development uh, opportunity, but it's a chance to meet the challenges of zero waste and clean energy. So thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Let's go to Adam Ortiz. Adam. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Adam Ortiz, uh, Director of the Department of Environmental Protection for Montgomery County. I applaud Delegate Charcutian for her leadership on this issue and we're here in support um, as you know, many of you know, uh, Montgomery County and others have a zero waste goal, trying to divert as much material as possible away from landfills and incinerators. In Montgomery County, just like many counties, between 20 and 25% of the total waste stream is food. And as we know, food is actually a resource that can be used again and again, if it's processed properly. So from a government perspective, this is a win for a few reasons. 
Number one, uh, many of us in uh, Montgomery County and in Prince George's, we work with the Maryland Environmental Service to create a, a product called Leaf Grow. We take that food scrap, we mix it with um, yard waste and leaves, and it's a, a product that is sold on the shelves of Home Depot, Lowe's, and other places. So that helps counties break even on their waste management systems. When that material goes to an incinerator, to a landfill, it's a loser. It's a big, big cost on, on the shoulders of taxpayers, and we never get that material back. It's there, it's gone uh, forever. But uh, with composting, we can do it again and again. So it's a win for government trying to balance the books. It's a win for the environment. All of us are talking about climate. Um, when food waste and organics go into a landfill, they become methane, which is between 20 and 50 times more potent than carbon. Composting is carbon neutral. It's also a win for businesses. So for collection uh, and disposal of food scraps, it is a fraction of the price of having it hauled away and treated as garbage. Um, it's about at least 15, uh, in some cases, 30% cheaper. And as many of you know, I oversaw the construction and the operation of the Prince George's County Organic Composting Facility, the largest in the state. And I'm happy to share any notes on the success of that program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see my time is out, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Let me go next to Emily Ranson. Emily? Good afternoon, members of the committee. I am Emily Ranson with Clean Water Action here in support of House Bill 264. Uh, so as has been touched on, whether landfilled or burned, the waste that we're talking about, this organic waste, it generates both methane and carbon dioxide. Methane being a potent greenhouse gas that's 86 times more potent in causing the climate to warm than carbon dioxide. And landfill methane emissions are, a, uh, are about 17% of Maryland's current methane emissions. And for the most part, that methane is being caused by organic waste. So HB 264 in targeting these uh, generators that produce two tons and then one ton of organic waste, it's a very efficient way of reducing the amount of organic waste just rotting away in landfills or getting burned in incinerators and turns it into a usable product through organic recycling or through donating servable food, uh, having it go into animal feed or other such process that uh, reduces that just carbon waste into the atmosphere. The bill provides significant flexibility, letting businesses decide how they want to reduce that waste. And just to you know, continually remind that this bill only triggers if there is that facility within 30 miles that has the capacity to take the waste. And so uh, with that, we urge a favorable, favorable report and are happy to answer any questions or provide any additional information on how this sort of uh, food source food source or food separation at the source uh, works in uh, businesses. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll listen to George Davidson. George. Is George Davidson out there? Okay. Yes, I was on mute. Sorry about that. Okay, go My ahead. Apologies. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Barve and fellow committee members, and thank you for your opportunity to testify in support of HB 264. Uh, my name is George Davidson, and today I'm representing the American Biogas Council. Uh, for those who don't know the ABC, we're the only national trade association representing the entire biogas industry, made up of about 230 companies and 2,600 2, individuals, including dozens in Maryland and more interested in doing biogas business in the state. Um, as you've already been told, Maryland has lots of organic waste that needs to be managed, and luckily composting and anaerobic digestion are two great solutions to this problem. Biogas systems recycle organic material like food waste and manure into renewable energy and soil prod products. Uh, this process creates economic value from waste and protects the environment at the same time and works well alongside composting since the digested material created from anaerobic digestion can, be served, uh, can serve as a feedstock for composters. Um, I want to say that the biogas potential in Maryland is enormous. Maryland has 24 biogas systems in operation now, but could build 169 more according to our Maryland biogas state profile. Um, and those extra systems would generate over $500 million in new capital investment, over 4,000 construction jobs and 280 permanent jobs, and would reduce emissions equivalent to removing almost 2 million cars from the road. 
Uh, for these jobs, investments, and emission reductions to be realized, biogas systems need consistent organic waste inputs. And other states' organic waste diversions bills like 264 have given biogas investors and project developers confidence that they will always have organic waste to use for their projects. Uh, Maryland can do the same with 264 and attract biogas development to the state. So I urge you to pass the, the bill to benefit your economy and uh, environment. And I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, George. Uh, next, uh, Roxanne Yamashita. Roxanne? Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Hi, my name is Roxanne Yamashita and I'm from Small Things Matter. It's a local nonprofit that serves over a thousand families in Montgomery County with our food rescue efforts. So I'm here to, in favor of Bill House Bill 264. Our program provides meat, dairy, and produce to a thousand food insecure, over a thousand food insecure families in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we get food is that we rescue food. We rescue over 250,000 pounds of food each year from our partnerships with Imperfect Foods and Wegmans. And this provides one third of the food that we give to the families here. Um, and also, in addition to this, they also compost the food and sequester, help sequester the carbon that and methane that would have been otherwise emitted into the environment. Um, we feel that this bill would allow a lot of people, a lot of other businesses, it would encourage other businesses and companies to donate food instead of throwing it away. And we could use this food to help solve the hunger crisis that we have right here in America right now. So we're highly in favor of this bill and we hope that um, it passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ali Dysart. Ali, I see you there. Um, all right, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so greetings on behalf of Moms Organic Market. I'd like to urge a favorable vote on House Bill 264, the Solid Waste Management, Organics Recycling and Waste Diversion Bill. Um, since 2005, Moms has composted all organic waste generated on site in our grocery stores and cafes. And we allow customers to bring in their home food waste for composting free of charge to any of our 20 stores. In 2020, we composted about 345 tons total, about 690,000 pounds. Um, we compost and offer composting because as a food produ provider and producer, we feel we have an innate responsibility to our community's health and making sure our business practices are sustainable with minimal negative impacts on our environment. The US EPA estimates that about 25% of waste is organic material that can and should be composted. In fact, Americans throw away an average of 1.3 pounds of food scraps daily. That's about 500 pounds per person per year. Um, it's extremely wasteful to not capitalize on capturing um, these beneficial organic material and instead burn it or bury it locally, um, thus polluting Maryland air, waterways, and further advancing the effects of global warming. Um, through composting, wasted food, and other organics, methane emissions are significantly reduced. Compost reduces and in some case eliminates the need for chemical fertilizer, and compost provides carbon sequestration, which is pertinent in the fight against climate change. Um, the global compost market is expected to reach an estimated $9.2 billion by 2024. Uh, with an annual growth rate of nearly 7%. Moms feels that it is extremely important for Maryland to be an early adopter and to support the growing local Maryland compost industry and its businesses. Uh, Moms partners with five East Coast composting companies, including Compost Crew, who just spoke. Um, three of them are based in Maryland. Um, I would gladly share contact info, best practices, success stories, roadblocks, et cetera, um, from our 15 years of experience composting at all of our stores. Um, I thank you for your time, and I urge a favorable vote on House Bill 264. Thank you. Okay, that's the last of the proponents. Um, before I open it up to questions, I have a question for uh, Adam Ortiz. Adam, did you testify that uh, composting is cheaper for the customer than landfilling? Uh, yes, my experience anecdotally, and uh, I know we have compost crew um, in the audience, Mr. Chairman, is, and it goes to the tip fee. So um, the materials picked up, whatever it is, and it's taken to the place of disposal. If it's garbage or trash, it's going to a landfill and incinerator transfer station. Typically those tip fees um, on the super cheapest side are around $50 and can be as expensive as 80 or $90. So that, that's an important cost. Um, for composting, the tip fee, you know, sort of depending on a few factors is between, you know, 35 or $40 and $50. Um, and that's because so they're just cheaper to operate and they make money. So um, so yeah, but I would, I would invite any collectors if they have, uh, 
yeah, they have more information for you, Mr. Chairman, but yes, the costs are cheaper. Okay, uh, any, qu any questions for the uh, witnesses who testified in favor? Okay, I don't see any questions, so um, thank you very much. Let's turn to the opponents. First is Sarah Price with the Retailers Association. Hi, thank you, Chairman Barve. Uh, good afternoon to all honorable members of the committee. My name is Sarah Price, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association. Uh, I would like to note that despite the position that I have signed up with, we do support reducing waste and expanding the recycling and composting markets in Maryland. As we expressed to Delegate Charcutian, we are still in the process of reviewing this legislation with industry stakeholders and our members. And unfortunately, I am not able to sign up as TBD. While the overall response from our members so far seems to be that most grocers are either already fully in compliance or do otherwise make an effort to dilute their food waste from the traditional waste stream, um, we do have some questions and concerns regarding the requirements of the bill. The language of the bill is a little bit vague regarding uh, waste calculations and enforcement. Uh, it doesn't appear to mention any reporting requirements of uh, industry members. And while we would not support report, or, excuse me, support reporting requirements due to the associated administrative burden, um, it does create some questions for the industry about how the overall waste diversion requirements will be overseen and enforced. There were also concerns expressed from our members about the requirement for diverting post-consumer waste, as many grocers work with the agricultural industry to divert food waste for animal feed, and many farmers will not accept certain items. We do appreciate that uh, the wide variety of ways that the bill allows for food residuals to be diverted, and we look forward to working with Delegate Charcutian on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Pam Casemeyer. Pam, you out there? I am. Sorry, okay. I was trying to get up. I am. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Hello, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Pam Case Mayor here on behalf of the Maryland Delaware Solid Waste Association, respectfully in opposition. The opposition is a little odd in that obviously we are the collector infrastructure, um, we are the private waste sector. I do want you to know that our opposition is not based in the fact that we have landfills because all of Maryland's landfills are publicly owned and operated. So this isn't a competitive, um, a competitive municipal solid waste landfills are publicly owned and operated. Um, we do have some recycling facilities and transfer stations, but I wanted to just raise some practical questions that I think make the bill challenging. Um, one is the tonnage requirement. Um, container size and tonnage is not the same. So once again, I think as raised by the retailers, trying to figure out how one is sure whether you fall in this framework or not becomes a little bit challenging. Um, I would again like to raise the whole issue of infrastructure development. Um, understand this is intended to create um, uh, incentives for infrastructure development, but I'd like to use one anecdotal example. Howard County had an effort to permit or to site a wood waste composting facility. No odor, no issues as often as associated with food waste. Even the environmental community opposed that bill because they didn't want it in their area. So as nice as it sounds, even those who are often the biggest proponents, all of a sudden have a change of position when facilities are being developed. So I think the industry would like to see a lot more focus on addressing infrastructure development than, um, than disposal management and bans. And then the last issue is I'm running out of time is contamination is a big issue. Contamination, you collect what you think is source separated, it's contaminated, the facility won't take it, you then have to divert it somewhere else. Those are expensive issues for these companies who would find that our haulers are having to charge to take their waste to different places because it's rejected at the first place because of contamination. Okay, thank, uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Anthony Clark with Galway Bay. And good, after, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm here, uh, obviously, in opposition 
of the the bill, but I'd, I'd like to explain a bit about that as well. Um, I'm a, we're a restaurant group. We operate four restaurants, three in the county, one in the city. And we're regarded in the field of the restaurant industry as being environmental and friendly. And we pride ourselves in that and the achievements we've made over the years. Uh, we've reduced the amount of plastic we use in our facilities. We use compostable straws and compostable containers for carryout. And we've reduced water uh, usage at our restaurants. And we've even put solar panels on one of the roofs of one of our restaurants. And at Galway Bay, we've been composting for over eight years now using veteran compost. And we did this as a choice. We did it as a business choice to, um, you know, be a greener company, not just because we're Irish, to just be a greener company, to reduce our carbon footprint because restaurants, we realize, do use a lot of uh, energy. Um, just to describe some of the challenges we had in going to composting, and I just thought this might be interesting for you, it took us nearly eight weeks to train our staff and adjust the, be the behaviors and habits of everybody to separate. We had to introduce new containers and make sure that we had everything separated, obviously the food, food waste in one. Um, and even with recycling, we recycled with the city of Annapolis, but it, it, you had to be very careful what you put in there. So we were not able to eliminate our waste hauler as well. So we had to use three. So it does cost us more as an operation, but again, we chose to do that. Um, again, as I'm representing the restaurant industry, the, the thought of another mandate coming at us, coming out of this year, is uh, just, just disheartening. And we just have enough to deal with, really, to get back into an operational standard that we're more used to uh, in the next coming year to um, hopefully, sorry, my screen just went up. Um, so just to, to wrap up, I'm not in favor of the bill because of the mandate. We do support composting and we do support these practices by restaurants to do that because we are big energy or energy users and um, I'm available for questions if needed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Melvin Thompson with the Restaurant Association. Melvin. Thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Melvin Thompson. I represent the Restaurant Association of Maryland and we are also opposed to this legislation this year. I first want to thank Delegate Charcutian because we did have several conversations over the interim. Our Government Affairs Committee met several times to talk about this issue and they still have many concerns and unanswered questions. Um, you know, there are still some questions about transportation costs and whether those transportation costs would be higher with an increased frequency of pickups because a lot of restaurants don't have a lot of storage space. And so, especially during the summertime, it may require more frequent pickups, which may increase your transportation costs. Um, there are concerns also about keeping the material on site. Um, in a sanitary manner. We had a restaurant operator who worked in another state who told us that in his restaurant, they had to have a separate walk-in unit for refrigeration inside the building just to hold the food waste um, in a sanitary way before pickup. And so there, those are some, just some of the questions. And we also still have some trouble, which has been mentioned already, estimating the amount of food waste that restaurants generate, restaurants of various sizes, because there is no measurement or weighing of the food waste or um, regular waste right now. And because they're not separating it, restaurants do not know. We were very appreciative to receive the Massachusetts uh, estimator tool from Delegate Chartoukoudian. And a couple of our restaurants did use that and they found that they would be subject to the mandate as outlined in this bill. And so we do still have some questions about infrastructure and Mr. Clark is right. Um, our industry is going through a tough time right now. We're on a long road to recovery and we just can't allow for the passage of this type of legislation right now with unknown costs when we don't know how long it's going to take our industry to fully recover. And I asked Mr. Clark to join us today because I know there will be some questions and I thought that you would like to hear from a restaurant operator who is actually experienced with composting to answer some of those questions. Thank you very much. All right, and finally, Alex Butler on behalf of Mako's opposed to the bill. Uh, no sign of Alex Butler, Mr. Chairman. Okay, too bad. I had a question for him. 
Uh, all right, so first question goes to Delegate Otto, second to Delegate Stewart. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, I, I want to give the good gentleman for Galway Bay uh, credit for, he has a fine shepherd's pie and, uh, and good Irish whiskey. And uh, I wish we were able to uh, consume some of it here <laughs> in the near future. Um, he has a tent outside, so you can go. <laughs> does he? <laughs> yeah, he does. I haven't walked down that street. I'm sorry. I, I, I stayed on the other side of the bay. Yes, we miss you all at Galway Bay. <laughs> but okay. oh, but yeah. my, my question is uh, the cost, and I understand your concerns about every cost is a, a concern now. And what uh, additional mandates this might make uh, for your business. That's that questions to me, I presume. Yes, sir. And um, yes, uh, you know, at the beginning, when we first did composting, we did actually calculate it because you're right. Restaurant businesses, we have to watch every single cost that we can we can manage to keep our prices down and to be, um, you know, inviting to the, the public to participate. But um, when we did it originally, we thought we could reduce to just uh, composting and recycle because we also re recycle our yeah. So there are three different centers, but we ended up with so many restrictions on what went into the composting as well as the recycle that you end up with certain items that just won't fit in either. So we gave up and we actually have three forms of waste removal. Now we do have our regular contract with Republic Services. And they're also, you know, based on the totes because the streets in Annapolis are smaller. You can't have these large containers. So we have smaller totes that can come up and down our alleys and are put outside. So the cost did increase ultimately, but again, we made that choice as a business decision to compost and to recycle and to just isolate the, the amount that went into the landfill to the minimum. And, and that and that space is expensive, correct? Oh yes, yeah. yeah those uh, three containers there, that, that eliminates a lot of outdoor dining and... Uh, well, we, we keep the containers in the rear yeah. of the building, which is pretty small also. It's very restrictive, but they come out to the front for pickup later on. Yeah, but uh, that increases the traffic coming through the uh, city and... Uh, yes, there's a, there's a, an additional truck that comes in to pick up our, um, our, our composting, as well as recycle, as well as the trash. So there's another carbon print there that adds to your uh, situation. But. Yes, you, you could say that. Okay, Delegate uh, Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two quick questions. So I, I heard, first, I agree completely with Delegate Otto's thoughts on Galway Bay, which is one of my favorite restaurants in Annapolis. Certainly don't want to put any undue hardship on Galway Bay. I, I'm a, more of a partial to the burgers, uh, for the record. But, uh, <laughs> here, um, but I heard I heard some chatter. I mean, obviously, we're all concerned about the restaurant industry in these tough times. And I heard, I, I believe, Mr. Thompson said, you know, not to put any uh, additional restrictions on restaurants at such a turbulent time. But I'm reading the bill now, and it looks like the effective date is 2023. So I don't know if this is a, a question for the opponents or the bill sponsor, but there's, is there an amendment moving that up? It looks like 2023 for maybe like really large operators and then later on uh, like the next year for smaller ones. Am I reading that correctly? I guess anyone can take it, including the bill sponsor, as long as the chairman allows it. No, I, uh, we'll, we'll have staff look into it. I, I don't want to get into going back to the yeah. opponents. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. Unless there's an amendment, look, just isn't that so? It looks like the effective date is 2023 to me. Um, and then uh, and then another question, just in terms of like the additional cost, like Delegate Otto, I'm sensitive to that concern as well. But um, just, I guess, for the two uh, gentlemen who just spoke, um, are you given any comfort by the waiver um, in the bill um, that, that provides uh, those entities that are affected and have increased cost um, to be able to apply for for a waiver. 
And thank you for the question, Delegate. And, and I'll go back to your previous question regarding the effective dates of this in the bill. Um, we do have concerns because we don't have a crystal ball and we don't know how long it's going to take our industry to recover. Um, there are some experienced operators who believe that it could take our industry up to five years to fully recover. Remember, we were the first impacted. Um, we endured it the longest. A lot of our operators are still um, operating with restrictions. And, um, you know, for, for, for the most part, a lot of our operators have had to take on additional debt that they will have to pay off. And that's going to take take quite a while. So that was the reason why they were uncomfortable with this type of mandate with unknown costs. On the issue of the waiver, while we certainly do appreciate that language in the bill, and we did share that with Delegate Charcutian, um, we also remember that there was waiver language in the polystyrene foam bill. And I do remember seeing news stories when that became effective that MDE actually received, I think, 54 applications for waivers and they denied every single application. And so I don't know if that really gives us comfort when it's going to be the department that determines the criteria and whether or not such waivers will be granted. I see, well, uh, thank you, oh, sorry. Uh, before I recognize uh, Delegate Weivel and Love, um, let me follow up on that, Melvin. Uh, the bill from my very quick reading appears to not be quite as precise in the definition of cost. Um, so how would you feel about it if we change that, uh, if we tightened up that provision saying that the waiver would uh, be granted if the cost was not lower? And we did, like I said, have a lot of conversations about the waiver. And I certainly do appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. And I would have to take this back to my committee because at the end of the day, their position was that we would have to oppose this legislation this year because we just cannot risk the passage of legislation that, that creates a new mandate on our industry um, with unknown costs. And so I'm not sure that they would be willing to reconsider that position if we could tweak the language or work on amendments. I did not get that authorization from them, but I can e go even, back to But to be clear, I'm saying the, the, the waiver would be, would go into effect if the costs were higher. That is correct, but it's with criteria that is determined by the department. And so, you know, there was some discussion about the language of this waiver in the bill, and we talked about it for quite a while, and we decided that they were not interested in tweaking that language because at this point, um, and where our industry is now, they were opposed to this legislation, and I was not authorized to negotiate amendments regarding the language in the bill on waiver or otherwise. Okay. I'm happy to take it back to my government affairs committee. We will continue to have discussions about this. And I think you heard from uh, the operator who testified last year, if restaurants can save money by diverting their food waste, then they're going to do it. In fact, they'll do it voluntarily. But at this point, we have more questions than answers. We even reached out to our counterparts in Massachusetts to find out what some of the challenges were there and the kinds of questions we should be asking, the kinds of things we should be concerned about. And a lot of our concerns were echoed from those conversations as well. And so we will continue to work with Delegate Sharkoudian on this issue. This is just not the year to do that, considering we don't know how long it will take us to recover. And so- Okay, know, okay, uh, great. Delegate Weivel, then Delegate Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd be interested in hearing from either Mr. Thompson or Mr. Clark, um, logistically, how would it work? I know you're, uh, how much food waste is generated? Do you weigh your food waste on a, weekly basis to know how much you're generating to see whether or not you'd be subject to the requirements of the bill. And then also, Mr. Clark, you talked about knowing someone who actually had to add an additional freezer to, um, to store the waste. Um, so can you address the issue that was raised earlier about the rodent problem? Is it real or is it just imaginary? 
Um, I'll address the first part. I think Melvin was the one who, who talked about the restaurant with the, the, the cooler requirement. And um, with regard to the, the totes that we use, and as I said, in, in, in Galway Bay, because of the street restrictions and our side alleys and storage containers, we don't have those large cans that most recyclers and, and trash haulers use. We have the smaller totes. Now they hold about, when full of food waste, about 200 pounds. And we do measure it, obviously, with our, our sales revenue being reduced by close to 45% for last year during COVID, that has obviously decreased as well because it's proportional to the amount of people that we serve, as well as it's proportional to the amount of food we do in carry out. And obviously we've done a lot more carry out this year, um, bless you, um, rather than um, actually dine in from where we get the food waste from. We only have the waste from the preparation. So we weigh it every week, we measure it. We actually, I, I, I declare it to this, the, the state in the amount of recycling and, and waste that we declare each year. They do a, a survey on it every year for us. So those, they're already recorded. So we will vary in capacity and, and by calculating us at full business and if we were all dining, that's why those other calculations are so vague for us as restaurateurs because we're all different. We do different styles of food and. And, you know, some might be consuming more in there than, than carry out or some certain types of meals have more waste attributed to them, like bones or whatever else. So it's, it's just difficult for each restaurant. They're so different to really calculate what you would have. But I could see us getting close to the, the 1,000, um, um, or sorry, the one, the one ton was it one ton um, measurement to uh, be brought into that legislation. And that's really what we're asking for is that restaurants just have so much to deal with. And even if it's three years out, you're just putting another concern on us to worry about going forward. And I'll pass it over to Melvin now. Yes, and uh, thank you for that question. I did mention that there was an operator who talked about working in a restaurant in another state and they had to use a separate walk-in cooler. And the reason for that is because restaurants have very limited outdoor real estate. So when you have an operation where there's very little space and you're generating a lot of food waste and you are diverting that waste, in order to keep it in a sanitary manner, you may have to keep it inside a facility and chilled um, so that it doesn't you know, smell and attract vermin. And so they talked about how they had to have a separate walk-in in order to hold that waste for pickup. Um, and I think one of the reasons that they did that was because it helped them to manage costs. Because as I previously mentioned, um, if you're generating a lot of waste, you may have to have more frequent pickups with your hauler. And if the facility is not close by, then that could really increase your costs with transportation. And that also relates to um, some of the concerns that we have regarding the unknown costs when you're dealing with these kinds of issues and transporting waste and not knowing where the facilities are um, within your area. All right, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Terry, you're muted. Are you calling on me? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Melvin, can you give me a rough approximation of how many restaurants produce two tons of food a week, 4,000 pounds? That is a good question. And we don't know the answer to that question because as I previously mentioned, uh, restaurants are not currently separating and weighing their food waste from their other waste. And so we don't know. And that is why the estimator tool was used that was provided by Delegate Sharkudian so that our restaurants could experiment with that. And those who were on our legislative committee um, took a look at those estimators tools and, and found that they would be under the mandate in this bill. 
Um, but I do not know how many restaurants statewide are generating two tons or more. It would likely be the larger restaurants, but again, the threshold does lower in the second year on this bill, and that would bring a lot more restaurants into the mandate, again, if they are within a 30 mile radius of a facility that has the capacity and also is willing to accept that waste. And so there was concern about more restaurants being subject to the mandate once this was fully phased in. But okay. again, we don't, we don't know the number and that is a very good question of restaurants who are generating that much waste. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may follow up. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, but right now you've mentioned several times um, about the pandemic and, and the pressure on the restaurants. So a lot, less, a lot fewer restaurants are serving food, correct? Right Correct. now. Okay, I th that was more of a rhetorical question. So fewer of them would fall under this anyway, right now. Um, so I, I find that question, that statement a little curious, um, but that's not my question, my follow-up question. My follow-up question was really about this, this whole need for a walk-in and, and to keep it sanitary. And I mean, restaurants are already disposing of this food waste right now. And they're already dealing with having to keep that from vermin. So can you explain to me why this has come up as an issue? This just doesn't make sense to me. They're already handling it. Right, and these are issues that we did discuss. And I would like to comment just on the estimator tool because in the estimator tool, it actually uses an estimate based on the number of meals that are served by a full service restaurant, as an example, would generate two tons of food waste if they're serving 4,000 meals a week. A limited service, which does more carry out, would generate two tons if they were serving 8,000 meals per week. And so that is the example and tool that our restaurants on our legislative committee use to determine whether or not they would be under this mandate, not the amount of food that they're currently serving under the pandemic restrictions. So I just wanted to make sure that I clarified oh, that. Of course, but let's clarify that it's not hitting them right now. That, right. that was my point. Right. But to the, to but the, the second question, but again, the I mean, how the are program. restaurants handling they're, um, they have to dispose of this right now. They have to make sure it's sanitary right now. So why is it that creating this would be such an imposition when they already have to make sure that they're not having rats running everywhere? Well, the issue is, and this was raised several times during last year's hearing, um, that they are unsure about the types of containers and how those containers are sealed and whether those containers um, would, would hold the waste in a manner that would not allow for leakage. Um, and this is a concern because uh, a lot of the garbage that is disposed of now is contained in plastic bags. And some of the containers, as Mr. Clark mentioned, are totes, and we don't know whether those are sealed properly like a plastic bag would be with regular waste outside the facility. And so there was some question about the type of containers that would be used and whether those containers would attract um, pests and whether they would be acceptable to the health department. And Mr. Clark can probably talk a little more about the experience that he's had, but that was a concern that was raised by our operator who testified last year. And we discussed it also within our committee. Can I add a little? Sure, go ahead. And so, yes, we do use containers. We don't use plastic bags. All of the, pardon me, um, food waste goes directly into the totes from our trash cans that are in the kitchen and separates it all. I think where, you know, where the, the refrigeration part comes is that a lot of the, the schedule pickups for composting are different than the others. So it depends on what the schedule would be. And if you're dealing with something like crab waste or or something else that's seafood based and you're concentrating that amount of food in one area, it's not really, it's as much as the, the vermin that it might attract if it's not in a sealed container, but you also have to deal with a smell that isn't attractive around a restaurant that people are coming into, which is not food smells, but waste smells. And that might be a reason for the refrigeration that would be needed if you were composting on and separating that amount of food waste separately. 
Okay, it looks like uh, Delegate Otto has a question. And let's try and make this the last question so we can get to the other bills, if that's possible. Not well, certainly, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make a question about the, uh, uh, we were talking about smells and we we're talking about scheduling, uh, handling of these things. Uh, um, I, I don't know who is the uh, last person that's responding to these things, but there is a lot of issues and uh, isn't that so? I think the answer is yes. Uh, okay, <laughs> any other questions uh, for any of these witnesses? Seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the public hearing on House Bill 264. Let's proceed to House Bill 204, Delegate Learman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, nice to see you. Um, so before I had the good fortune of coming on to the Environment and Transportation Committee, you all know I had the pleasure of serving on the Appropriations Committee on the Transportation and Environment Subcommittee. And while I was there, I worked every year <laughs> to request additional reporting from our environmental agencies so that we could examine the level of enforcement that was happening for laws that we had already passed, sometimes laws that we'd passed decades ago, right? it's now up to MDE and DNR to be enforcing those laws. And so we started requesting for the first time enforcement reports, quarterly enforcement reports and annual enforcement reports. And what we found was that enforcement has steadily declined. Um, this happened even when we withheld money and said, you can't spend this money on anything but enforcement. They just didn't spend the money. So you know, we did everything that we could through uh, requesting regular reporting and what we've seen is just enforcement goes down every year. And unfortunately, I'm sorry to let you know, that is the same thing um, that trend has continued. So the latest annual enforcement report came out. It's for the year that ended June 30th of uh, 2020. So mostly a non-COVID affected year. And there were some new record lows in enforcement actions. But, and like I said, this is just part of a broader trend. As we've seen, um, record low enforcement actions on you know clean water, clean air laws all over Maryland. So last year we came to this committee with a very strong bill that would have created an environmental and natural resources ombudsman to provide additional oversight and investigatory support and communications assistance for these environmental state agencies and for the public, for your constituents and my constituents related to environmental and conservation laws. This year, um, that bill passed the Senate passed the full Senate and sort of sat in the House uh, in our committee. This year, we have streamlined the bill. We were in communication with MDE and DNR throughout the interim. And so this is a much simpler version of last year's bill. And all it does is it says, okay, MDE and DNR, all of the information on inspections and complaints and other compliance information that you would have to give to all of us or any of our constituents through a PIA, we just want you to maintain that on a public facing website. Just put it on a website so we don't have to request do PIAs all the time. And that website will publish information regarding enforcement actions that have been initiated by MDE and DNR, as well as information on the status of permit process of the permit process for facilities. The information on that website will be updated at least monthly, um, maintained in a database format so that your constituents and my constituents can uh, can find things and it'll be kept online for 10 years. Um, so that's the bill. <laughs> it's a very simple bill. And, you know, I think both MBE and DNR would acknowledge that their dramatic reduction in staffing has substantially limited their ability to adequately communicate, engage with the public, with our constituents, or to process and respond to public complaints of environmental violation. And that not only in a failure to serve the public, but it diminishes our rights, the rights of Marylanders to assist in identifying and stopping environmental violations. So HB 204 will ensure that public records are clearly presented to the public and is actually a cost-saving measure for MDE and DNR because it allows those agencies to save time and resources by not having to fulfill so many PIA requests that they receive requiring them to Instead, this is just place the information, the non-confidential public information that would be available in a PIA, just put it on a website. Um, so uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And we have a couple uh, advocates and uh, environmental lawyers here as well who can also answer questions. But with that, I ask for a favorable report of HB 204. Thank you. 
I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, Delegate, since you don't have that many people testifying in favor of the bill, why don't we listen to all of your witnesses and then we'll take questions for you and the other three people who are signed Great. up. So, uh, in this order, Doug Myers, Angela Heron, Jesse Eiliff. Um, Doug Myers. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Doug Myers and the Maryland Senior Scientist at Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Chesapeake Bay Foundation supports HB 204, which requires the Department of Environment and Department of Natural Resources to make complaints and enforcement data more available to the public through websites and reports to the governor and the legislature. CBF has uh, played a watchdog role. One could actually call it, we're an ombudsman uh, between the public and the state agencies for the resolution of uh, environmental uh, regulations. Compliance with laws that are passed by this body and regulations promulgated by agencies with the help of broad stakeholder involvement represents the public's role in preventing pollution of the state's waters and destruction of fish and wildlife populations and supporting habitats. <clears throat> Residents often reach out to us directly for environmental organizations to seek advice and guidance on where and how to submit information regarding potential violations. Uh, I often use the EPA ECHO database, which has uh, records of compliance uh, to self-reported data by uh, agents or organizations that hold discharge permits. Sometimes there'll be multiple quarters of violation uh, that are uh, listed on that website that I find out from EPA that are self-reported by the applicants with absolutely no information from MDE uh, about inspection reports or compliance. So HB 204, um, steps, uh, take steps toward increasing the transparency that's in line with citizen expectations and the capability of contemporary technology within our agency. We <clears throat> urge a favorable report on HB 204. Thank you. Okay, uh, next let's go to Angela Heron. Hello, thank you. Hi, I'm Angela Heron, Senior Attorney with Chesapeake Legal Alliance. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of HB 204. We submitted written testimony, so I'm gonna aim to be brief. This bill creates much needed agency transparency and improves public access to information regarding pollution violations that impact our water quality and our public health. The current system for obtaining this pollution violation information is through a Public Information Act request or a PIA, which is usually time intensive and costly for both the public and government agencies. HB 204 will reduce the burden on agency staff um, of having to fulfill these individual requests by proactively putting basic non-confidential information online. This will save the agencies and the public both time and money, as Delegate Lehman stated. So the need for this bill has been really felt acutely during the pandemic. Uh, at MDE, PIA requests have been backed up for months and were often just unable to be fulfilled due to this archaic paper system um, on which they currently rely. So I wanna briefly underscore three things that this bill does not do. First, it does not expand the type of information that agencies release to the public. Everything that is called for in this bill is already subject to a PIA. Second, with regard to posting about alleged pollution violations, no identifying information for any individual or facility is allowed to be posted. So instead, the bill requires that MDE post a summary of the total number and types of complaints it receives in each county. I know there's been some confusion about that, so I wanted to be really clear. Um, this information still is really important because it will allow the public to see MDE's progress toward fulfilling its enforcement duty by responding to these alleged violations. So finally, this bill is not novel or revolutionary. All the other Bay states and many states throughout the country have greater transparency and accountability information online. HB 204 will just modernize and streamline Marylanders' access to this information. So for the reason, we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, and final witness in favor is Jesse Eiliff. Uh, Jesse. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jesse Eiliff. I am the Southwest and Road Riverkeeper with Arundel Rivers Federation in support of House Bill 204 for three main reasons. It would improve transparency in government, it can improve enforcement of environmental law, and it stands to improve citizen involvement in protection of our common natural resources. So as some of the other witnesses uh, and Delegate Learman have mentioned, it is a bill that would allow publicly available information to be readily available over the internet um, for any interested party. And 
as Mr. Myers mentioned, as a representative of another environmental organization, I am frequently asked about enforcement matters within the watersheds that I look after and often will have to spend valuable department personnel time by submitting PIA requests or even simply just by following up with staffers and asking questions about what has happened in respect to a given case. And those sorts of calls and hours spent by department staff could be alleviated by passing the bill. Also, it is, as Ms. Heron said, already a feature of many other states that this sort of information is public and that can help with people who are interested being able to stay involved with the management of their natural resources. And then finally, one point is that part of the problem with diminished enforcement is also a uh, byproduct of diminished staffing at these departments and their enforcement programs. And to the extent there is concern over the fiscal note and hiring of more people to run this program, uh, I think that that additional staffing up of the programs would be a good thing in the end. And so we're in support of the bill. Thank you. Okay, are there questions for the sponsor and any of these four witnesses? Um, I don't, oh, yep, Delegate Weivel. I was just wondering if anyone could directly respond to the fiscal note, as I've heard several folks say that it would result in savings and operations, but the fiscal note says 300,000 the first year and 200,000 annually thereafter. Um, others might have other things to say, and I don't know if James has anything to say. We were very, very surprised by the fiscal note. Um, currently, MDE is already working on a web, like working on developing its web presence. Um, so I don't know where this fiscal note came from. <laughs> it was, it's very contrary to all of the conversations that we had and that the advocates have had with the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, so we are quite surprised uh, by it. And I can't explain it right now, but we are investigating it to try to understand like where it came from. Okay, I would also, I, may I also add to that? Is that okay? I, yeah. I wanted to add on sure. the fiscal note. I have, um, on the fiscal note itself, I believe it's on page five. I'm trying to pull up the direct quote, but um, there is a statement um, that they, they say, you know, without direct experience of this um, program, yeah. it's very difficult to estimate the cost. And I think what you, you may be seeing here, as, um, as Jesse Iliff mentioned, you know, MDE has, a, has a, a staffing shortage. So anytime you ask them to do anything new, they're gonna say, ah, we need more people for that. And that is definitely a, a separate issue and problem. Um, but I do not believe that this fiscal note really took into account the savings. Um, they just were looking at what they um, estimated, which again, as Delegate Newman said, we're, we're surprised since we know they're actually already working on this system <laughs> to put this information online. Um, it, it only looked at one side of the coin and not the other in terms of the tremendous savings of staff time um, to fulfill these public information act requests. Okay, any other questions? I don't, oh, Delegate Otto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, got back in here uh, understanding what's going on with this. Uh, uh, so our, uh, our uh, DL, uh, legislative services is not doing due diligence. Is that what you were saying with this or? Uh, no, I don't think we said that at all. We just said that we were surprised because it doesn't it doesn't compute with our understanding from our discussions with MDE. Um, so we were surprised and it's not, it just doesn't comport with the conversations that we've had. On, so what, on what, what's the cost differences? Uh, I mean, how did they <coughs> get an increase? Um, I can't answer that, Delegate Otto. We need to do some more background work with the agencies to better understand where this fiscal note could have come from. And so you're blaming this on COVID? Is that the? Uh... <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not blaming well, Maybe anything we can get it. a federal grant out of it. We... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'll blaming anything on COVID. Thank We've you. been having good conversations with <laughs> agencies. All other Bay States already do basically what we're asking Maryland to do, even Pennsylvania, eek. 
So uh, we're hoping that we can make sure that we keep up. So you're, you're asking us to do something that we haven't been doing and we've been the leaders in the Bay Restoration? I'm, we're, this bill is about making sure that your constituents, Delegate Auto, ha, don't have to file PIA requests to get information from agencies, but rather that that information is available online to them. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Uh, I don't see any, so um, let's go to the opponents. Uh, first signed up in opposition, Pam Casemeyer. Actually, Pam Casemeyer and Bob Enton are both in opposition, so we'll take them in that order. First, Pam. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Pam Casemeyer here, uh, respectfully uh, in opposition to this bill. Um, we certainly understand the intent that the sponsor has with this bill, and it isn't that we are opposed to um, people having access to information that is otherwise available. But I think that this bill is much broader than that in many ways. And the way it is constructed could create tremendous um, misperception uh, and information uh, for the public about certain facilities and also could lead to um, motivations for filing complaints. Um, at least I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the Maryland Delaware Solid Waste Association. As you can well imagine, facility, um, there's a lot of uh, people who do not like our facilities, do not want our facilities operating where they are, do not want them to go back. Um, and you have here complaints, inspections, and enforcement actions. So filing complaints does not mean that the complaint itself is valid you can create a very negative public impression if people know that the number of complaints uh, re related to a facility are gonna be posted on the website before they even have been adjudicated or determined to be valid. Similarly with inspection reports, an inspector will come to a permitted facility to do an inspection. They may find something that is of concern the entity has the ability to respond. The inspection report ultimately may or may not be correct and or may or may not trigger any kind of action or may be resolved simply and may be a minor technical issue versus a significant environmental issue. Publish them, publishing the, those kinds of um, pieces of information on the website for anyone, for any reason, and I understand and some of those, before they're adjudicated, I do not believe are necessarily subject to FOIA because they're not, there's not, this doesn't say inspection reports and responses from the permittee. So I think there is now enforcement actions may or may not fall in a different, um, in a different area because they clearly uh, are further through the adjudication system where there's been um, some action and response by the regulated community. But I think the ability to have this information posted um, the way it's framed in this bill could be uh, create tremendous public misperception of otherwise uh, responsible and well operating uh, facilities. Um, and for those reasons, we would offer, uh, we would request uh, an unfavorable report. Okay, uh, Bob Enton. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, Mr. Chairman, Robert Enton on behalf of the Maryland Building Industry Association, and we share the concerns expressed by uh, Ms. Ms. Casemeyer. Um, you know, I've, I've frankly never seen a bill like this before uh, that would uh, publish uh, uh, publicly um, suspicious activity. Um, uh, I don't believe there's any precedent for that in the state of Maryland uh, whatsoever that we would publish this on a website. Uh, the bill mandates uh, that uh, the department must process complaints of suspicious violations. Well, so it seems to me that's, that's a, you know, no matter how frivolous uh, the complaint uh, might be, it mandates that there be an investigation. And then you would go ahead and publish 
the suspicions, even though there's been no finding whatsoever of wrongdoing. And you would also, if you look at page, um, uh, I think it's page four on line one, you would publish the legal set settlements proposed um, uh, by the department. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see really, you know, what relevance that has. Um, I, I think the, uh, uh, it makes, you know, the, the information is available, but once again, just like a lot of other information that's out there, um, if you want that information, at least you have to go to some trouble to get it. Um, and that's why we have a, a, a free, you know, the, a, a process for, for doing that. Um, uh, it just seems to me that uh, uh, th this bill is, is, is just, you know, if, if it were uh, 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 trimmed down, and I, I, I know Delia Rearman said, and she texted me, we, we exchanged text messages last night that it's um, uh, trimmed down from last year, but I just think what gives the, um, uh, my client uh, a, a lot of concern is the uh, uh, publication of just mere suspicions um, and proposed settlements. It's just something that I think is without precedent. And uh, for those reasons, uh, uh, we'd ask for an unfavorable report. We're happy to continue, you know, to talk to the sponsor and the advocates and see if there's a compromise, but as introduced, we had no choice but to oppose it. Thank you. Okay, first Delegate Otto, then Delegate Love. Charles, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, we're working on it. There we go. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to point out, I think the rules of the House of Delegates was that we could meet but two hours at a time. And I think we met for uh, two hours and uh, uh, 13 minutes. So. Uh, <laughs> okay, do you have a question? <laughs> Well, that's the question. Uh, do we follow the rules of the order or do we? Uh, um... Well, um, yeah, it is. Well, no, I, I, I mean, I, we are scheduled to meet from 1.30 to 4.30. I thought it was a two hour. Uh, that's uh, only uh, in person on the floor. Has auto. that changed? That's I, I, have I not got the policy memo on it? No, I think that's. that's... that's... <laughs> go, go ahead, Trish. Sorry, that was me, Mr. Chair. Oh, all right. Delegate, Who was it? Sarah? Delegate Sarah? Yes. Oh, okay. Delegate Otter, that's on the floor in person. That's that doesn't apply to Zoom committee hearings. Right. Well, I thought we were having things at 1130 in the morning and we were having at 130 and this yeah. and we weren't going to do things yeah. too no. long. No, that's, it, you're stuck, sorry. I'm stuck. You're well. We all. <laughs> yeah, we're all, we're all stuck. <laughs> that's right. We're all stuck. But but, we're all stuck. We're all stuck. But that, that was the question I had. Is that I? We started at one thirty, and it's yeah. uh, now uh, we're three forty eight now. Now, yeah. Charles, we're going to bash on unless you have a question. For all right, witnesses. Uh, well, like go to forward. Tell you. Okay, well, we raised the issue. So. Sorry, Mr. Chair, to, to have a witness. I know we want to move forward. I just had um, one question for Pam and for Bob. Um, we're not the only state to propose this, correct? I mean, Virginia does this. Georgia reports every enforcement action matter by date. So we wouldn't be creating something out of whole cloth, putting a huge burden on Marylanders. Isn't that right? Uh, uh, let me just say this, Delegate. Uh, uh, go ahead, Pam. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I've not seen, I, I would be uh, 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 really appreciate if uh, the proponents could um, uh, communicate the citations for those statutes. You know, my experience is that very often when you look at a, you know, a statute on a particular subject from one state to the other, there are very dramatic differences. I don't know what the other state statutes provide. They may have a a bill that deals with the disclosure of violations of natural resources law, but I don't know that it, whether or not it, it provides this or not, and I'd be happy to, 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 to look into it. When we uh, testified in the Senate, we then had a, uh, my client, we had a conference call 
uh, with the Senate sponsor, and she was going to have, I think, the proponent from the uh, Chesapeake, I think, Bay Foundation, uh, uh, give give us uh, her contact information so we could go through some of these questions, but we haven't received that. I'm happy to meet with anybody and talk to anybody about it. And, and, and likewise, I am too. I don't know if the other state language is the same or similar. And again, I think um, there's there may be vast differences between complaints, inspection reports, and enforcement actions. This is a broad range of information. So we'd, we'd welcome the opportunity to look at how some of the other surrounding states are handling this and what range of information may or may not be handled similarly. Well, that was enlightening. Any other questioning <laughs> questions? All right. Uh, in that case, um, just for the record, uh, James McKittrick has offered informational testimony and uh, several other people have written both for and against the bill. So that concludes the public hearing on House Bill 204. Let's uh, proceed to House Bill 295, Delegate Love. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Delegate Sarah Love here to present to you HB 295, Water Pollution, Stormwater Management Regulations, and Watershed Implementation, Implementation Plans. Phew. Long title, wonky, but accurate in explaining what the bill does. Maryland has made tremendous progress in investing in and restoring the bay, largely thanks to the work of this committee. However, much of that progress is threatened by the impact of climate change and by our not adapting to that change. We all know through our work in this committee, through our reading and through our own experience, that storms are more frequent and more intense and there is increased okay. flooding. For example, in 2019, in my district, an intense storm hit so fast and so hard that drivers were caught on the road and they had to climb up to the top of their car. Um, in another section of my district, a portion of the road in the middle of a neighborhood caved in. And again, in September of the following year, we had another intense storm, flooding streets and stranding drivers. I encourage you to look at the links I cite in my written testimony and to read the testimony from one of my constituents. Uh, the video is, is quite astonishing. So even though we know this, we are currently using rainfall data from the 1990s. That data is what informs how current construction addresses stormwater management. So projects that are going on right now are building to address storms from 30 years ago, storms that were so much less intense, less frequent, and with less rainfall. So it's no wonder we have so much flooding. Now, the good news is that MDE knows this, and they're currently pursuing two paths to update that data. One is through the Chesapeake Bay program, and this data should be available by the end of the spring. The other is through a multi-state agreement to update that data through the Atlas 14 storm data. So they're already collecting this updated data. HB 295 does a couple of things. First, it makes sure that MDE gets that updated data as soon as it's available. Second, it makes sure that MDE is updating its regulations on a regular basis as a result of that data. Third, in updating the regulations, it ensures that MDE consults with a range of stakeholders, including the counties and municipalities who are on the front lines of managing these floods. Finally, the bill codifies the governor's commitment to our phase three WIP goals. Prior to pre-filing this bill and ever since, we have worked with MDE and with the municipalities and counties as they are the ones who are on the front lines implementing these regulations. And they are the ones who have to pay for and mitigate the effects when we have these floods and these stormwater management regs fail. And it was, as a result of that work, we have some amendments and I'm happy to go through them if you would like. Um, but for these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on HB 295. Thanks. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm also going to uh, go through the uh, proponents of the bill and just want to note to you and to all your proponents that apparently no one has signed up in opposition to your bill. So it's going to be the following people in this order. Morgan Johnson, number one, Jesse Iliff, number two, Doug Myers, number three, Matthew Johnson, number four, and, and finally, Adam Ortiz, number five. So let's start with Morgan Johnson. Mr. Chairman, 
Yes. I had a question for the bill sponsor. Should I wait until after? Yeah, we... yeah. Let's let's go through all the uh, witnesses, and then you can ask the bill sponsor uh, and all the witnesses who are in favor. So yeah, just keep your hand up, and I'll get to you. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay, Morgan Johnson. I think you need to unmute yourself. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that and for allowing me to testify in favor of House Bill 295 today on behalf of Waterkeepers Chesapeake. Our waterkeepers work tirelessly to fight for water quality and resilience in their communities, uh, whether they're dealing with sewage backups in homes in Baltimore or sampling after floods in Anne Arundel County. Our water keepers know all too well that there is no part of our state that's untouched by the climate attributable increases in storm events and their intensity and resultant flooding. And to illustrate this, um, I'd like to uh, share some of the photos from my written testimony. Um, the first of which are images uh, from flooding that occurred in summer of 2019 in Montgomery County after heavy flash rainfall led to floods. And this particular event sparked local officials to seek out FEMA relief uh, and to boost the moniker Turn Around, Don't Drown to address the risk of these events to human life. Um, these images I think most of us know well. Um, they're from Ellicott City's flood in 2018, which drew attention uh, to the impact of development and climate change when a thousand year storm killed two Marylanders and did immense damage uh, to infrastructure and small business. Uh, these floods are not happening only in these places, they're happening across our state. Uh, these are images from Baltimore County, uh, from St. Mary's County, Worcester County. Worcester. Oh, sorry, Worcester County. I'm so sorry and Prince George's County. So these images really illustrate this issue is urgent and touches our whole state. Um, this bill provides a critical piece of the puzzle in preventing these floods from ravaging our communities, waterways, and ultimately the Bay, <laughs> and supports our local governments that are working on the front lines of responding to these disasters and scaling our stormwater infrastructure. And we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, uh, let's next go to Jesse Iliff. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Again, my name is Jesse Iliff. I'm the Southwest and Road Riverkeeper with Arundel Rivers Federation in Edgewater, Maryland. Um, as Ms. Johnson alluded to, as a waterkeeper, I can attest to more incidents than I'd care to remember of finding sediment escaping from a construction site specifically. Uh, and going to the enforcement agencies, either county or state, to complain about it and being told that upon review, the plans were, the building was done according to plan, but the plans were not sufficient to deal with the storm. And this will happen several times each year. And the reason for that is because the requirements for construction sites are based off of regulations that are based off of data that is out of date. And this bill would help to enable the department to have a continuous reassessment of the data in hand. And it is important to remember that these data are in fact in hand. Um, and that would help to modernize the equation because the way these regulations are based now is off of uh, what are called intensity, duration, and frequency curves that uh, simply do not apply to modern weather events where we can see several inches of rain fall in an hour's time. And if a storm's requirements based off of whether it is a one-year storm or a 10-year storm or what have you, uh, reflect requirements over a 24-hour period, even if you get less than a 10 year storms rainfall, but you get it in 30 minutes, you're going to have infrastructure that is strained and oftentimes overwhelmed. And for those reasons, we urge a favorable report on House Bill 295. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next, Doug Myers. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Thank you again for hearing me. My name is Doug Myers. I'm the Maryland Senior Scientist at Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and we support uh, HB 295 with amendments from the sponsor. 
Uh, I'm going to pick up where Jesse left off and uh, explain this dynamic of uh, intense and frequent storms. Um, most of our stormwater infrastructure is expected to be able to store and then slowly release or infiltrate water to the receiving uh, streams and downstream to the bay based on calculations of past events of rainfall. Uh, the past events of rainfall that went into the calculations of how big those facilities need to be are from the 1990s. All of the most recent storms that uh, Morgan shared with you uh, were since that period of record. And so those storms have not been uh, included in the volume calculations of how we need to address storms of the most recent era. Uh, this is very important because we're in the process of updating uh, new stormwater uh, uh, permits for the Maryland jurisdictions that are to lead to are achieving the watershed implementation plans under the Bay cleanup. This is our last five-year permit. It's very likely that some of the um, uh, new standards will apply within this permit term and allow for a better uh, control of the stormwater, not just within those facilities, but the downstream flooding that occurs when a facility is not sized correctly and it in uh, increases the, the scour of uh, stream sediments on the banks of those streams downstream uh, and, and resulting in loads that have not been accounted for by the Bay program or the Bay model. So for these reasons, we support uh, HB 295, uh, urge a favorable report from the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, we'll hear from Matthew Johnston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I uh, really appreciate the chance to testify today. And I really wanna thank the sponsors for working with Anne Arundel County and really counties all across Maryland to on some amendments that are gonna make this bill achieve our goal, which is, as you've heard already, um, iterative stormwater standards that will change with our changing climate so that we can protect our communities. So just to give you one example of what's happened in Anne Arundel County, um, in a single week, in July of 2018, Baltimore Washington International Airport recorded three storms that exceeded by quite a bit the rainfall standards that our stormwater standards are built to. Um, that has real lasting consequences for our citizens and for our environment. And I know that a lot of you on this call are very much like me, um, where you are being inundated by stormwater complaints from residents and business owners every day. Um, and and I, I worked on some this morning, worked on some last night, uh, oftentimes with Jesse Iliff. And the residents' voices on these calls, they get to me because they've invested their livelihoods in these homes or their businesses. And for the first time in their lives, they're seeing water in their yards where they never saw it before. And they aren't in a FEMA floodplain. There's not um, help coming. And lots of times all that we can say is, it's unlucky. The development at the top of the hill was built according to the law, um, and the law was not built according to our storms. So that's really what today is about, and we would just encourage the committee to uh, uh, vote favorably with amendments. And just a couple more things that I'll give you are numbers of what this costs for counties. For every mile of stream that we have to restore in Anne Arundel County that's degraded due to this, it's $2.6 million for every mile. And that's handled by the taxpayers. So just another reason why these costs are real. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, we'll go to Adam Ortiz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Adam Ortiz, Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, this is a very self-evident issue that we have to catch up with policy-wise. It is very much not abstract. It is very practical. In Montgomery County alone, over the last 20 years, there have been twice as many severe storm events, most of them less than a day in length that aren't quite captured under the current uh, FEMA flood models. So we have to adapt and we have to step up because there's very real impacts, not just on water quality that we're all concerned about, but infrastructure, property damage, and public safety. In the event that Delegate um, Love, and we thank her for her leadership mentioned earlier in September, on that day, um, emergency services received in Montgomery County 150 calls for service for drivers who were stranded in their cars for flood events that nobody could possibly anticipate. So at the local level, as folks know, the permit holders, um, we're the ones 
that are carrying out these uh, big infrastructure projects in the watersheds. We're spending tens of millions, um, you know, e each of the um, phase one uh, permit holders to carry out projects, to, um, to deal with stormwater, to control runoff. Um, but it's so important now, as we're seeing the very real effects of climate change and these uh, events, that it is part of the regulatory calculus um, to consider the new um, severe storm uh, phenomena and the more precipitation. Uh, we've been speaking to the sponsors about the importance um, of having local participation, uh, working with MDE on this, and they've been hearing that um, because we're where the rubber meets the road uh, from the policies in Annapolis uh, to the residents and their impacts, we're the ones who put them in the ground. So it's clear this is a changing time, there's changing weather, we have to change our calculus and we have to change the requirements so we can meet these new challenges. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Delegate Love. Uh, thank you. We have a number of questions. Uh, first from uh, Delegate Parrott, then Wells, then Lehman, then Healy in that order. So Neil, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess my question is right now, when people design, engineers design houses or whatever, shopping centers, they're using the FEMA maps, um, like the FEMA 100 year map, FEMA 10 year map is are you proposing to replace that with something different? Who wants to take that? Matt? Sure, yeah, I, I can take that. Thank you, Delegate. Um, this is Matt Johnston, Anne Arundel County Environmental Policy Director. N no, what this bill does is outside of a FEMA floodplain, when you build a house or a commercial shopping center anywhere, you have to build stormwater practices wet ponds, rain gardens, what have you, and they have to treat a certain type of storm. Right now, that storm is the, the storm that you're guaranteed to see every single year based on very old data. So in Anne Arundel County, that's two points, a, a storm that will drop 2.7 inches of rainfall over a 24-hour period. What this bill says is there's better data out there. We don't know exactly what it is. It might be 2.9 inches. It might be 2.6 inches. Um, and we need to switch the standard from one day to, you know, two inches over two hours. Who knows? There's better data out there and we'd like MDE to take a look at it. But no delegate to get at the floodplain. This doesn't really pertain to the floodplains itself. It's about development anywhere treating the storms that, that rain on that development site. So uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so what is the design standard you're proposing to be? I mean, is it a typical 24 hours? Are you trying to get it down to just an hour? What, or are you trying to mix it and match it? So, sorry, delegate, should I? Okay, again, for the record, Matt Johnson, Anne Arundel County. Um, thanks, delegate. It, 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 this bill is not prescriptive. And yeah, for that, I think you heard from Adam Ortiz and myself, we're really thankful that the sponsors are <laughs> that will include counties as MDEs considering how to change the regulations. So it's not prescriptive. There's no, nobody looking into a crystal ball and saying it has to be a one hour standard, it has to be a one day standard, it has to be a 10 year standard. We want that conversation and we want it every five years. We want it data-based and scientifically driven. Okay, you good, uh, Neil? Yes, for now, thank you. Okay, uh, next question goes to um, Delegate Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the bill sponsor and uh, all of those that are here testifying today. Uh, my question, it just pertains to the fees or the penalties and wanting to know what happens to the penalties that are assessed and um, of the penalties that are, that are assessed, will any of them go to the organization that um, intervenes on the, in the enforcement action? Delegate Wells, I think you may be thinking about the citizen intervention bill. Oh, got you. Okay, this is not the same thing. Nope. Thank you. Thank you, though. I appreciate that. All right. Um, Delegate Lehman. <clears throat> Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I know you can. I know you cannot see me. I explained to Chair Barve that I my camera is not functioning. My good friend Adam Ortiz was uh, razzing me, saying, "We know you're taking a nap, Delegate Layman. Be honest." But I I really have been listening this entire time. Um, 
I am trying to figure out um, from Mr. Johnson, I think he might have answered this question about local participation and this ongoing conversation and input from locals. But as I understand it, MAKO and MML had initial concerns, per perhaps were opposed, but are no longer. I I'm not asking you to speak for those organizations, but since you're a county level official, is that is that accurate? Is that the case? Or should I ask that question of Delegate Love? Because she mentioned amendments, but did not go into the amendments. Thank you. Um, I would recommend um, asking that question of Delegate Love, but I can tell you that as a county, we have I have been working closely with MAKO and I think we're in a good place, but I'll hand it over to Delegate Love. My apologies, Delegate Lehman. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Sure. So I, I wondered um, that because I, I, as I understood it, that Mako and MML initially uh, either you know had concerns or were even prepared to be opposed. But it, it seems that you've continued to work on this um, language. I, I don't know that it's in the form of an amendment um, because you didn't go into detail on those. Um, but that there is going to be there's an agreement. There's going to be an ongoing conversation between the state and locals. Um, and, and local participation. Um, Correct. Yes. So it is all in our amendments. We addressed their concerns in our amendments. As and last I heard from MAKO and MML, they were fine um, with the amendments. They were FWA. Okay. Great. I I I I guess since they're not on here objecting, that's that in and of itself is a good sign. So thank you and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hold on, Delegate Healy, then Delegate Otto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is about um, the stormwater management regulations that are in effect now. Uh, I happened to be chair of AELR when these were first adopted, and then when they were um, actually going into effect, and, and uh, the people who were doing the various types of building saw the engineering that needed to be changed and all of that subject of a lot of negotiations by a lot of different stakeholders. And at that time, it was, it was very difficult to get even um, a one-inch storm at, it, uh, taken care of. The storm we saw in September in Prince George's County was a six-inch storm. It came in, in just in a few hours. Uh, we were stuck on East West Highway with while the water came up over the highway in Riverdale, which it's unbelievable. So um, the things are happening that nobody imagined even eight, 10 years ago. My question is, are, are, does this bill um, address the regulations that exist that were written with uh, Delegate Lawton's bill years ago? Or is this oh, new? I mean, is this something that's being revised anyway now, but maybe not adequately? Delegate Love? Matt, you wanna take that first? Sure, so I think Delegate Healy that you're referring to the 2007 Stormwater Act, which ended up revising all the regulations, local ordinances, stormwater manual in around 2007, 2010, or I'm sorry, 2009 or 2010. That bill actually took a full seven years um, from 2010 up until 2017 to take full effect. There was that long of grandfathering for projects um, by MDE. So one of the amendments that I think you'll see uh, deals with that so that there's not such long grandfathering that MDE actually has to, uh, when they change the regulations, incorporate them without delay. Um, but to your point, what does this actually change? It, it, is, it is those requirements. So in 2007, there was a whole rewrite of the stormwater requirements. I mean, kind of thrown out the window and put in new ones. This bill does not call for a whole rewrite. It calls for every five years, science and data to be reviewed by MDE in, and reported to the General Assembly. And MDE say, based on this new science and data every five years, we think we just need to tweak a number or we think we need to overhaul the regulations. That's the conversation that can be had once every five years. And does, does, does this bill require a change in the grandfathering that exists now? Because that was a very contentious issue 
back in the day. It, it doesn't uh, uh, speak to that old grandfathering. That has expired as of spring of 2017. What it does say is it directs MDE. I think there's an amendment, Delegate Love, that would direct MDE to not delay incorporation of new regulations. So we understand that, that there will always be a conversation with all the stakeholders. Maybe it's um, a 60 day, day delay. If you get your permit in the door, you're okay within 60 okay. days. But it was the 10 year fathering that I think left us with some legacy problems um, that, that, that are, we're still dealing with. Well, I, I think that though there were a lot of, um, I know there were policies done by the counties a long, long time ago that mm -hmm. sometimes they gave the zoning and everything but the building permits pieces of land that, that were going to be developed. And, and, and the developers sat on them for decades, generations, okay? But they had all the legal requirements in, in their hand. They, they didn't need to, to actually, and I, I'm wondering about how that goes into land use and zoning. Um, does it require the counties to reopen old wounds like that? No, no, it doesn't. Um, so from the county perspective, it's a, it's a stepwise process. You, you come in with an application plan, get your zoning approved, get the, the conceptual plan approved. And then at the end, when you're about to do construction is when stormwater is finally designed and put in the ground. So if, if a regulation comes in and it's incorporated immediately saying instead of 2.7 inches, please treat three, then that will have to happen in the middle of that permit process. Regardless of what the local zoning has decided in, in the past years. Uh, the, I, again, I would hand it over to Delegate Love, the sponsor, but I, I think um, without putting too many words in her mouth, the intent is we don't want a 10 year permit sitting out there that in year 10, they still get grandfathered. So yes, even if all the other decisions have been made, the new stormwater standards would apply. Thank you very much. Delegate Love, do you want to comment on that? Nope, just to say ditto everything Matt just said. Okay, thank you very much. And who can question the opinion of a guy who has a model of the Saturn V rocket behind him? <laughs> okay. Um, Chairman, if I may, it's a Lego model. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still Even better. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, delegate Otto, then Delegate Holmes. Yeah, that's unrecyclable plastics. So. Don't get into that. <laughs> Thank you. The last questions and the answers have uh, just raised more questions with me. I mean, uh, how does the um, Soil conservation uh, districts and all, they do a lot of the stormwater plans in most of the jurisdictions and uh, how they fit in and how's this gonna impact them. And uh, uh, my concern is that uh, is not as so much, it's a cyclical change in the climate. I remember rains in the seventies with uh, we got, uh, you know, five or six inches at the time uh, you know, within a single storm. And uh, I, 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 I don't know how far your data goes back and who's collecting the data. And, uh, and I don't have a whole lot of trust in it, be quite honest. Delegate Otto, I, I think the point of this is, as Matt said, it's not prescriptive. It doesn't lock in for time immemorial what has to happen. It says to MDE, use the most updated science and you're getting it already. And then on a regular basis, take a look and see if you need to update your regulation. So if we get less rainfall, they'll update that. If we get more rainfall, they'll update that. So it's, it's actually a tool that the counties really need and really want. And, and I'm sure you saw those pictures, all of us really need as well. So, so what's regular? Uh... Annually or by that's, that's what MDE is going to look at. They have different ways of looking at it, and that's how they are going to deal with it based on the current science. It's so not that's not that's not 
prescribed in this legislation? No, it just tells them to rely on the science on a regular basis. It doesn't so tell them how to regular, write them. Regular is sort of... Uh, Within five years. Hmm. Every five years. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to prolong the program, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your diligence. Okay, uh, Delegate Holmes. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to follow up on some of the things that Neil was trying to bring out. Because, you know, Neil, I think Neil and I are probably the only two in the community that actually have designed streets and storm drains. And when you design a storm drain, for example, on the street, you know, the five-year inlet and the 10-year inlet, I mean, the five-foot inlet and the 10-foot inlet are usually designed for 10-year storms. Are you in this bill trying to revise the design standards? I'm, and, I'm just, and I'm trying to figure this out because if you're trying to, to revise the design standards, don't you have to do more than just uh, have suggestions through MDE? I mean, you've got the National Society of Professional Engineers down in Alexandria. You know, there's a whole lot of people that need to be involved in changing design standards. And I'm just trying to figure out, you know, mechanically, how does this work? Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so mechanically how it works is uh, MDE publishes a stormwater manual by which all the construction has to fulfill the standards in that stormwater manual. There is one chart in that stormwater manual that says your stormwater practices have to be built to, to uh, treat this much rainfall. For Anne Arundel County, it's the one year 24 hour storm, which is 2.7 inches. This bill basically says there's new data, MDE once every five years, can you please change at least that table? And that would mean that those rain gardens, stormwater ponds would have to treat to a new standard. Um, whatever MDE and the stakeholders agree to in that five-year period. But it also is not prescriptive. So if MDE took a look at things and they said, wow, in Anne Arundel County, it's changed from 2.7 inches to five. We need a whole scale look at it, at this. Then they would go to the stakeholders. They would come to the General Assembly, we would hope, and they would say, things have gotten a lot worse. We need to take a whole scale look at our stormwater standards. So delegate, I think the easiest answer I can give you is it could be a very simple update or depending on the science, it could be more complex and we want to involve all those stakeholders. So, so this is this is kind of like, uh, just, I don't want to get too deep in the woods. This is kind of like revising the intensity chart. Yes. Okay, and, and you know, hold on yes. what we're talking about. So, so you're revising the intensity chart on the feet per square per square inch of of off of uh, of rain off, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you, okay, so this guy uh, square. It, I got you. Okay, okay, all right. All right. You, you got it, delegate. Yep. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. Thank you. You'll have to write down the words you didn't say and give that to us later later on on the <laughs> committee. Uh, okay, it appears there are no further questions. Neil, do you have one last bite at the apple? Or are you good? Okay, let's move on to the people who were signed up as favorable with amendments, Bob Etten and Tom Ballantyne. Uh, and that would, that, would, that would be it. So Bob, you're next. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, once again, Robert Etten on behalf of the Maryland Building Industry Association, and we are signed up favorable with amendments. Um, and just let me make a couple comments. Uh, I would urge everybody on the committee to take a look at the fiscal note. You have a four page single space fiscal note, which states categorically uh, that this, uh, uh, these changes in the law will have a very dramatic uh, fiscal note uh, for state expenditures, local government expenditures and industry. Uh, uh, clearly and unequivocally, they state that. Um, secondly, uh, the major concern that, that we have is the timing. Um, you know, the way I read the bill, maybe I'm, I'm reading it wrong. Of course, I have not you know, seen any of the amendments uh, 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 that have been proposed to the bill. But the way I read the bill, the bill just doesn't say, you know, there's going to be a study and a report back. The bill mandates the way I read it, that the um, uh, uh, department shall promulgate regulations every five years. Now, you know, the truth of the matter is by the time they collect the data, 
by the time they go through the meet with the stakeholders, by the time that they uh, promulgate the, uh, propose the regulations, and by the time those regulations go through, that may very well be a two-year process at least. Um, so we think that, you know, for us, the permitting process can take two or three years before you start construction. So you have all the planning, all the engineering work, you got the permit, and now practically by the time you're going to ready to start construction, and you still may be in construction, there's no grandfathering and everything changes. So that's one of the concerns we have. We'd be a lot more comfortable with the bill if that period of time uh, uh, was extended. The um, other comment uh, that I would make is that the um, uh, there is no uh, uh, per, the the bill mandates regulations uh, uh, be proposed by Jan by January one of two thousand twenty two, uh, ten months from now. That's just not really practical. Uh, finally, I would just say that in responding to to Delegate Healy's uh, uh, question is, you know, grandfathering is important. You know, whether it's, you know, with five years, 10 years, depending on where you are in the process, there should be grandfathering. Uh, so those are our concerns. I would uh, 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 look forward to receiving the proposed amendments. Maybe they address some of those concerns. And if those concerns can be dealt with, we don't have a problem with the bill. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tom Ballantyne. Uh, he's not available. Okay. Uh, questions for uh, Bob Enton. So, well, let me let me ask a question here, Bob. Um, first of all, did you turn invisible? I don't know. <laughs> no, my I, I think it says my video is on. I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. It's all real strange for me. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Okay. <laughs> no. So basically, I mean, you you sound like you're more opposed to the bill than favorable with amendments. I mean, do you? You have specific, uh, have you written down specific amendments that we can look at in subcommittee? I, I don't have specific amendments. Once again, I know, you know, the, the Senate hearing was two days ago and I, the same thing, you know, there are amendments, nobody sh uh, shared them. And, you know, um, you know, one thing that, that, you know, we have not been involved at all amongst the groups that have come up with this. And in fact, when you look at the stakeholder group, there are no builders or developers or engineers designated as being uh, a stakeholder as this goes forward. So we've been kind of on the outside on this, uh, quite frankly. But once again, I think, you know, if, if the period of time is our, our, our main concern, the mandate that they must adopt regulations is a concern. And we believe there should be some kind of grandfathering. If those areas could be addressed, I think we'd, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd be okay with the bill. Okay. But, uh, so that we find it problematic in its present form. Uh, it looks like the sponsor has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the amendments, uh, I will follow up with you, Mr. Enton. They address a lot of these questions. Great. And isn't that so? <laughs> Great. Thank you. I'm, and I apologize to Delegate Love. I didn't reach out to her until last night. But I have to tell you that if you're signed up as a lobbyist to testify in three different committees, right, and if the bills aren't always taken in order, you got to have like, you know, all these different computers going all at the same time to try to figure out where you got to be. I got done in, in judicial proceedings last night at seven o'clock. I just, you know, just. It's, well, that it's, makes me it's, feel it's so much better. That makes me feel so much better. Uh, okay. <laughs> any, um, any other, uh, look at Marvin. Okay. Uh, any other questions for uh, uh, Mr. Enton? Seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the public hearing on House Bill 295. Thank and you, Mr. Chair. Proceed to the last bill of the afternoon, House Bill 407. Uh, the sponsor is the vice chair of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I realize this is the last bill, so I'll talk fast. Um, House Bill 407, it's similar to a bill we heard a couple of weeks ago. House Bill 302 would set that bill will set up a licensing board for the whole septic or on-site wastewater industry. This bill just focuses on the on-site wastewater property transfer inspectors. They are the individuals who inspect a home septic system when a house is being sold. And that is the time, the best time to discover and fix any problems with the septic system. 
So having a well-trained inspector is very important. Currently, the only training that an inspector needs to have is taking an MDE approved course, but MDE does not require inspectors to actually follow any of the course's recommendations for inspections. So that leads to a lot of variability in the quality of inspections. Some inspectors will just flush a toilet and look around outside to see if they smell anything or observe a problem. Others follow the MDE recommendations and open up the system with cameras in the unit, and in some cases even dig up parts of the system. So given the differences among procedures that are used by inspectors and the differences in septic systems, it's important to improve the training of inspectors. And that's what this bill does. The bill would improve the MDE course, require training and licensing, ensure that the proper inspection procedures are followed and require that a detailed written report is provided to the home buyer. It also sets up an enforce enforcement process and penalties. So septic professionals, environmentalists, and the Associate Maryland Association of Realtors all support this bill. They agree that the problems with inspectors are urgent and that they, the inspector should be licensed immediately while the larger septic board gets organized. There is one amendment I'm proposing, changing the fine for noncompliance to being based on the number of septic systems inspected by someone who do, does not have a valid license. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I urge a favorable report. Okay, um, you have uh, one, two, three, four, five people signed up. I would uh, ad advise everyone here that no one has signed up in opposition to the bill and only one person has an amendment that they are proposing. So uh, given that, let's uh, first go to Jean von uh, Gunten uh, uh, as the first witness. Uh, Jean, are you there? Yep, you're there. Yes, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Good afternoon, I appear before you today in support of House Bill 407. My name is Gene Von Gunton. I live just outside of Westminster, Maryland. I spent my entire working life, 38 years, with the Frederick and Montgomery County Health Departments, specializing in helping homeowners with difficult septic problems. My role here today is to represent the impact this bill will have upon local health and the home buying public. I was present in 1997 when Brian Frosch proposed the idea of licensing private septic inspectors. His legislation was greatly watered down during the 97 General Assembly, but nevertheless, it substantially changed the way that septic systems are inspected at the time of sale. House Bill 407 restores many of the critical elements Frosch intended to include. I have spoken to the Attorney General and he supports this effort. His office supported written comments in support of the initiative during the previous General Assembly session. Typically, a home buyer has very little knowledge of septic systems, but buying a house with a flawed septic system can be devastating. This bill elevates private septic inspectors to a professional and responsible level. The serious committed private inspectors welcome this bill. The few bad actors will shape up or exit the field. I believe that once MDE establishes this professional licensure, the program will be largely self-sufficient, the opportunities for continuing education will increase, and the result will be an improved private industry that is essentially self-policed. In the end, the bargain, I'm sorry, the burden to referee these inspections will be removed from local health, and home buyers and sellers will benefit from the increased certainty that a critical part of the home's infrastructure is no longer a black hole in the backyard. I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Th uh, thank you. Next to testify will be uh, Matt Geckel. Matt, you out there? Is Matt? I'm not here now. Yes, thank oh, you. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman and committee members for providing me the opportunity to testify in favor of HB 407. My name is Matthew Geckel. Um, I'm with Back River Precast, a Maryland precast um, concrete company specializing in wastewater um, systems. Every week I get a phone call from a homeowner who has had an improper uh, property on their septic system, wanting to know what they can do and how to mitigate the financial problems that they now face because they had an inspector come out and inspector system 
and who really didn't do a good job. He just kind of came out and looked around, and that's all he's required to do because he's not really required to do anything. He's just required to get certified by MDE. So every week I'm getting phone calls from homeowners who just purchased a home and don't have any additional money to put into a very expensive repair. And typically on these older homes, it's younger couples who are buying them. And these older homes need very expensive repairs, anywhere from 30 to $50,000. And they just don't have the money. And it takes a year or two for them to get a functioning septic system. I've also talked to different people in the industry who are performing these inspections and they welcome a level playing field where everybody does a proper inspection. The people that are doing the proper inspections are top of the people just short cutting the process and collecting a fee and saying, yeah, it's okay and moving on. Thank you very much. I hope you testify. I mean, I hope you um, wrote in favor of this bill. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Matt. Next, uh, Edward Harrison. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Eddie Harrison. And I'm testifying in support of House Bill 407. First, I would like to thank the committee for its hard work and support of this initiative last year. I'm a small business owner of BAT Onsite LLC, an automated onsite wastewater operation and maintenance provider. I'm here to represent Maryland Onsite Wastewater Professional Association, or MAPA, as their legislative liaison. MAPA is the Maryland trade organization that represents all the professionals who work in the on-site industry in Maryland, from installers, pumpers, property transfer inspectors, to designers and code officials. We have been around for over 20 years. We provide a platform for the on-site professionals to network, acquire education, and air out issues that we may deal with in the industry. These, these, li this, these licensing initiatives are born from the on-site industry professionals, both of these licensing bills. And they have been vetted through the industry professionals for many years, from all sectors of the industry and all over the state. The current MDE property transfer inspector certification program has been problematic from the start. It requires that all on-site wastewater property transfer inspectors complete an MDE approved course of study, and that's it. After completion, you're certified for life with no re prerequisite for the certification or uh, on-site wastewater knowledge, um, accountability, continuing education, or renewal. MAP is one of, one of the organizations that offers the course. The course is offered once a year and fills up fast. We, ha we had started up offering the course twice a year prior to COVID. A lot of on-site wastewater property transfer inspectors can hold licenses from other professional boards and then adding the MD certification. But these other professionals are not versed in the science and complexity of modern septic systems. This bill can bring all inspectors under a license with continuing education and prerequisites. We have seen the health officers amendments. We cannot support the first, but are fine with the change in the assessment of the penalty. People that are buying a home are likely making- If you could wrap up your testimony, the com committee would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, people are buying a home are likely making the biggest purchase of their lives and deserve quality comprehensive report on the condition of the largest in all. Please give us, please give this bill a favorable report to protect Maryland's, Maryland's most valuable asset. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, a Emily Ranson. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee, Chairman Barbe. I am again, Emily Ranson with Clean Water Action here in support. I will keep it brief. Basically, property transfer inspections right now are the best opportunity in order to uh, identify problematic failing septic systems. And if these property, if, you know, if the inspections are occurring, we want to make sure that they are actually providing the service that the homeowner is purchasing. Uh, until a problematic septic system can be identified, it will be continuing to pollute nearby waterways with untreated human waste. So these inspections are our opportunity to make sure that it is functioning and we uh, strongly support uh, this licensing in order to make sure that those are going to be those high quality inspections. Uh, so again, here in support, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. 
And finally, Sarah Trescott, who I believe has an amendment. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, committee members. I'm Sarah Trescott representing the Maryland Conference of Local Environmental Health Directors. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. The Maryland Conference of Environmental Health Directors supports the licensure of property transfer inspectors by the Maryland Department of the Environment with amendments. Last year, the conference engaged with the advocate and MACO to reconcile regulations for the on-site wastewater industry. After several meetings, the advocate, the conference, and MACO agreed that on-site wastewater property transfer inspectors should be licensed by the Department of the Environment. In House Bill 407, MDE will be responsible for the training and licensure of the property transfer inspectors. Section 9-217.2.D2 of the bill requires the department to adopt specific provisions. We believe this would best be accomplished by the department who is charged with training and regulating the licensure of the inspectors. The deletion of this section would provide MDE the flexibility required to set the training, examination, licensure, and enforcement procedures of the property transfer inspectors. However, to ensure adequate enforcement authority is addressed, MDE would be, would be required to write the regulations and is amenable to setting up a work group to address regulatory concerns. Uh, section 9-217.2F2 discusses the parameters for administrative enforcement, namely it outlines that each day will constitute a new violation. The conference believes that if each day were charged, were changed to each inspection performed by an unlicensed inspector, the violation would be better represented based on actual if inspection could, uh, violations. If you, could wrap up your, if you could wrap up your testimony, the committee would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Delegate Otto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was just inquiring uh, uh, the speaker, the testimony she was given that uh, we had uh, uh, looked at this issue last year. And uh, is there a bill number from last year? Or Dana, do you have a bill number from last year? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this was uh, introduced only in the Senate, I believe. Okay. Oh, so uh, this is did first they time. pass it? Uh, yes. But we didn't get a bite at it, so. Correct. All right, I, I, I appreciate the uh, association of, uh, of the counties uh, sanitarians and all to uh, testify before this. And I, I think it has uh, a lot of the issues that we need to address and uh, and would look forward to any further information we'll have. I'll look at the written testimony, so. Okay, okay. Um, any further, um, any further questions for uh, uh, these witnesses? Okay, seeing none, that ends the public hearing on House Bill 407. It also ends the public hearing for today. So are there any announcements from any of the subcommittee chairs? We are gonna meet, the leadership group is gonna to meet today, but I don't wanna announce that until after sub chairs have had a chance to talk about. Yeah, Dana? Yeah, uh, the, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The um, Environment Subcommittee will meet at, let's say 4.50. 450. How much work do you have to do? Um, we have three bills, so I would say we should be done by 530. 530. Okay. Um, all right. Any other subcommittees? Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Elliot Holmes. Yes, the Housing and Real Property Subcommittee, uh, let's say we'll meet at 445. And uh, for your information, Mr. Chair, we have one, two, three, four, five, six bills. Uh, so 445, 530. I'll, I'll try to get this done by 530. Would that be okay, Mr. Chair? 
Yeah, because I'd like to have leadership at 530 if that's possible. Any other announcements? Anyone? How about non-sub chairs? Any announcements for the good of the order? If not, then uh, we are going to adjourn and I'll want to see my leadership group at 530 uh, via Zoom. Okay. Good job, guys. See, us, uh, see you all. Uh, some of you, uh, some of you at 530 and the rest of you tomorrow. Thank you, Trish. <laughs>